why don't we get started? Yasmin, will you take the roll, please? Carrasco? Corrales? Here. Mahan? Here. Esparza? Here. Foley? Here. Thank you. Great. I think that establishes a quorum. Why don't we get started? Uh, I'm glad you could all join us today. Uh, we have three reports today that we'll be discussing, but the first one is our economic update from Elizabeth. Elizabeth, do you have a verbal report for us? Uh, Chair, it doesn't seem like Elizabeth is on right now. Let me check on that. Is she, is she around? If not, we can move on to the, uh, the next report. Oh uh, yes, why don't we do that? That's uh, acceptable. Okay, great. Since we don't have anything to review in the work plan and no consent items. So let's move on to the next one and we'll uh, address, we'll have Elizabeth speak when she pops in. Uh, we have the first report then is a report on real estate services audit. And I believe we have Joe Rios here. Royce. Uh, good, oh, sorry. <laughs> no it. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Joe Royce, city auditor. And I think Vicki's gonna share her screen because we have a short presentation. Perfect, thank you, Vicki. So I'm joined by Leonard Hyman and Vicki Sun from my office to present our audit of real estate services. Better tools and coordination can improve asset management and service delivery. I believe Nancy Klein and Kevin Ice from the Office of Economic Development are here as well. So I would not know who. Well, I okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. So the city owns uh, more than 1,200 parcels of land, including municipal facilities such as city hall, fire stations, and libraries, parks and open space, revenue generating enterprises such as the airport or the convention center, and facilities uh, leased to outside organizations. The Real Estate Service Division of the Office of Economic Development is responsible for a range of real estate activities for the city, including managing facility leases and telecommunications, property use agreements, and property acquisitions and sales. Real estate works closely with other city departments on real estate related transactions to support city projects and initiatives. And it should be noted that real estate does not manage all leasing activity in the city, though they will assist other departments in their leasing activities. The objective of this audit was to assess real estate services processes for tracking city properties and revenues. And we had four findings. The first finding is that uh, better tools would improve coordination for real estate asset management. So real estate services division, as I mentioned, manages the city's properties to facilitate real estate related transactions to support city projects and generate revenue. However, this work is hampered by not having a consolidated inventory of real estate assets. When property questions arise, the division often will be required to conduct extensive research on properties, such as reviewing old documentation, reaching out to different departments to identify who is responsible for managing properties and other tasks as necessary. Division uses a third party database of real estate assets to help in these inquiries, but it does not contain complete up to date information on the city's real estate portfolio. Other departments, including public works and the finance department, maintain databases of properties as well. However, they serve different purposes and are similarly limited. Having a complete real estate asset inventory and implementing asset management software can help the city better manage its properties in the future. The second finding is that having an up-to-date inventory and better coordination can help the city maintain its vacant properties. Among the city's real estate holdings are vacant lands and vacant buildings. However, the city does not have a current list of all such properties. The city's planning building code enforcement department last updated the city's vacant lands inventory in 2015 as part of the regional housing needs allocation or arena process, but it was meant to include only those lands that could be designated for urban development and does not exclusively include city-owned properties, nor those potentially with structures on them. Having a complete listing of city-owned vacant properties and buildings can help the city identify potential opportunities for such properties to meet other citywide goals. 
They also help real estate services coordinate and ensure maintenance issues, including weed abatement, repairs, or other problems can be addressed timely and appropriately. And we have a couple of recommendations to that approach. Our third finding is that real estate services manages various property and telecommunications leases. So real estate manages 32 property leases where the city is a landlord and 23 telecommunication property use agreements. Property leases include commercial leases that generate about $1.6 million in fiscal year 1920 and below market leases to community-based organizations that provide services that benefit residents. The city also manages property use agreements with private telecommunications companies and these generated about $1.4 million in fiscal year 1920. And to incentivize macro cell development on city properties, real estate is working on a market rental rate analysis to determine a new fee structure for macro cell telecom leases, or telecommunication leases. A macro cell facility is a part of a mobile network that provides coverage through a high power cell site, such as a tower and antenna. And the macro cell fee structure was last updated in 2006. And we have a recommendation that Upon completion of the market rental rate analysis, the uh, real estate bring the new potential new fee schedule to council for approval. Our last finding is the city should update the municipal code and policies around surplus land. So the California Surplus Land Act imposes restrictions on how the city disposes of or transfers city-owned surplus land. Surplus land is land that a local agency, such as the city, decides is necessary for its use. City Council Policy 7-13, the Sale of surplus property with provisions related to affordable housing provides guidance around the identification and disposal of surplus land as outlined in the city's municipal code. However, or although the city's policy currently aligns with state regs around the identification of and declaration of surplus land, the city will need to update the muni code and policies on transferring or disposal of surplus land to fully comply with ongoing changes to the Surplus Land Act. So our report includes a total of six recommendations to improve real estate services processes for tracking and maintaining city properties. I'd like to thank the Office of Economic Development, the City Attorney's Office, and the other departments that helped us in this audit for their time and insight. I ask that you accept the report, cross-reference the June 15th meeting of the City Council, and I'll turn it over to Nancy or Kevin for the City's response, and we're, of course, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, um, I'm going to turn this over. This is Nancy Klein, Economic Development. I'm going to turn this over to um, Kevin to, to respond. But we really wholeheartedly want to thank the auditor and his staff that this effort was one of seeking to understand and seeking to help us make our work better, um, which this was the first time that um, our team has gone through an audit. And while we were anxious to begin with, it was a very supportive effort. So I'm, we're very grateful. And Kevin, if you would please walk through our response, that would be great. Of course, thank you. So um, Nancy, Nancy said it, uh, this was a, a very helpful uh, set of findings and recommendations. Uh, there's value added in what uh, Joe and his team brought forward and it reflects um, the good understanding that they did up front to get to know our team, our workflow, and how best, you know, how our work could be improved. So our response uh, on each of the recommendations is that we are looking to implement them uh, over the next year to two years. Uh, we are underway with a property database that will have uh, lease management capabilities. And that will be the foundation that is responsive to the first finding and then allows us to uh, reach out to our partner departments and work with them to bring city data into one ecosystem. So we can't do that part alone, uh, but there, there's great value in our establishing for real estate's purposes a functional database that can then uh, integrate efficiently with other databases that are uh, scattered around in different silos around the city. And I think not just real estate or the Office of Economic Development, I think the entire, uh, you know, department-wide um, city, city functions here will be improved by allowing our, our different silo databases to coordinate uh, when it comes to real estate information. Right. For the, 
Go ahead, Kevin. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, for the for the telco, uh, we we absolutely agree uh, that the the work we're doing now to understand uh, better for our um, for rates to charge throughout the city and have that be uh, take into account the density of the area. We're seeing increased investment downtown and not as much investment in less dense parts of the city. So there's a big opportunity to dig into that and drive investment throughout the city with a, with a redefined rate schedule. And it also gives us an opportunity to look at uh, opportunities for uh, improved digital inclusion um, in uh, lower income areas of the city. And then for the surplus item, that is something that uh, Cameron Day is on. He and I have been uh, in talks about updating that. Um, there's the, our municipal code, you know, it includes exemptions like the one that went to the Supreme Court where we were, we were, it was struck down, right? And so we haven't been relying on our code. We've been following the state law. And so now there's some work that we can do to uh, bring everything kind of in alignment with state law. Great. Anything else? No, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Nancy, how about you? J just here to respond to questions. Thank you very much. Okay, great. First, I will turn to the public then and remind the public to please stay on topic. We are talking about the real estate services audit and uh, you have two minutes. And our first caller is Mr. Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Happy Monday. We're heading toward the end of May. Um, there was items about uh, dealing with uh, real estate purchases for mobile cell towers. And I hope that uh, that can allow me to speak on this item uh, and the importance of lining up, uh, you know, throughout in the purchasing of and 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 placing of, of cell towers to the placing of four and five G, to talking to the public. There is a, a a system of open public policy ideas that uh, is is being put into place and and being explained to, you know, mobile tower companies. I know there's previous years of good civil rights and good civil protection practices, we all understand this is a new time. We are in a new generation of ideas and thinking. And, you know, for, you know, these mobile telecom companies who place these towers, they're often the same people who end up as a part of the four and 5G process is my feeling. They need to set up a very clear notification process to the everyday public about four and 5G. That should be mandatory in how we move forward uh, and how, and just really good ideas of, of the hand in hand ideas I'm talking about of open public policy and four and 5G learning to work together. And it's simple steps like that, that can offer a lot. It's, it's incredibly important the San, city of San Jose learn the importance to do that and, and share, share the need to do that with, with, with telecom companies and that's how we create our future and, and good expectations and good practices. And, and that's what will make San Jose innovative. That's the idea of innovation is good practices, good, good civil rights practices. It isn't just the tech itself. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is caller user number one. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yeah, you guys are going to do a real estate audit. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to see it. I'd like to see you guys post this audit, what it looks like, who's involved in it, if there's any city council members that maybe got a little kickback here or there from real estate companies so you guys can somehow, you know, shuffle some money somewhere towards yourselves. I mean, I mean, Lori Smith did it in the sheriff's department. Why can't you guys do it? Are you? We don't know. But yeah, putting up these towers everywhere, not letting people know, not good, not good at all. It's, it's uh, 5G is coming to be dangerous. You guys know it. It won't be near your houses, though. That's a guarantee. But yeah, who audits the auditors? That's what I've always wanted. Who watches the watchers? Who audits the auditors? 
I'd really like to know. And if you guys are really transparent, you would post it on your Facebook pages, on Twitter, you know, all those companies that you guys love and get money from, or maybe just post it on the city, on the city website, you know, dot gov, on San Jose dot gov or whatever. You guys should be able to be proud of how honest you are because something tells me that you're not. It's just a hunch, just like there's probable cause that the police have to question you for your ID, which will probably soon be your We're your, talking your, about uh, the real estate services audit yeah. and not the yeah, police yeah. department. Yeah, I, I just, I just, I just told, I just told you, hey, hey, Pam, if you were transparent, you would let me talk. But you know what? You've always squelched me. You let the police walk me out of meetings. You're a squelcher. You're, you're, a, you're, a, you're a revenuer. You're no good. I'm not going to be voting for you. You're a terrible politician. You lie. You're, you're so full of crap. Your eyes are. Before I go to my colleagues, I'd like to make it very clear that the auditor's report is publicly available, both in this committee report uh, agenda and also it'll be available on the, uh, the council meeting when it comes to council on June 15th. So it's a very public document and readily available to anyone's access at this moment, anyone who cares to go to the uh, energy to locate it online. With that, I will turn to my colleagues, uh, Council Member Mahan. Thank you, Chair Foley, and I yeah, appreciate you clarifying that it is publicly available and extremely transparent to all, so appreciate that. Um, Joe, just a quick question for you. Um, when, when you went through the process of kind of evaluating how we do real estate services today and came up with your recommendations, did, did you consider the pros and cons of further centralizing real estate services. And I, I didn't quite see that. It wasn't a standalone recommendation. I know, obviously, we centralize our, um, our legal services in the city attorney's office. We, it seems to me that around IT and technology implementation, or at least, at least setting standards and, and for safe uh, security, cybersecurity reasons, we are moving toward a little bit more centralization, though there's still it's still federated to some degree. And I'm just curious, did you look at the overall model? Because you know there was mention made that other departments still do quite a bit related to real estate. And I'm just I'm curious where 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 you recommend that dial, or if you looked at and evaluated where, where we ought to turn that dial in terms of centralization of certain components versus federation. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, so the the. The first piece is coming up with that inventory and it's just understanding what we have and the scope of properties across the different departments. That was the first thing we just need to get our, our, our handle on. Uh, and there are a couple other factors of just to get us all to that, ne that next level is that you know, real estate should be taking on this, this larger role. So once a pretty small or small group, so it'd be a big change. And then trying to find where that dial is, you know, does um, for example, there's a lot, you know, the revenue generating facilities such as the airport or the you know, convention center, you know, they're, they're, they're managed in different ways. Um, uh, you know, then, then you think about like the municipal facilities, you know, there already is some centralization in the maintenance of the, of the you know, over in public works in terms of the, the maintenance functions. Um, so we, we didn't go all that way down that road. I think that's a, that's a really good question that let's get a handle on what, Let's, let's get this complete inventory and find out all these things that we own. And then we can kind of figure out where real estate might, you know, the piece that we thought was, could uh, really benefit from centralization is that coordination around the vacant properties and the maintenance of those properties. Cause that's where we were seeing there was a gap. There was a real gap there where there, where there was this information siloed. Uh, and Kevin used the word silo a couple of different times. And that's just the way the organization is. Um, <clears throat> but so we didn't go as far in that way. I think there's some opportunities there, but at the first point, we just want to make sure we get this inventory and then we can make that, you know, that organizational question second. And I, before I, 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 I move on, I did want to <clears throat> address the, the callers, other comment about who audits the auditors. So we get peer reviewed every two years and by other auditors who come in and look through our work papers. And those are all on our posts on our website at uh, San Jose ca.gov slash auditor. So if anybody wants to know who audits the auditors and sees what those reports, they're on our website. Thanks for adding that note, Joe, and, and appreciate the potential complexity involved. And so I think the, uh, the database and, and better managing our vacant lots does absolutely feel like the right place to start. And then 
Um, I, Kevin, one question for you, and then I'll, I'll be finished. But just curious, I, I may have missed this. I'm sorry. On the um, on the market rate analysis to determine a new fee structure, was was there any? I, I couldn't tell from your response. Are we, or I might have missed it? Are you signing up to do that? And is there a timeline for that work? Uh, yes. Uh, so we are uh, under contract with an appraiser to to bring in data both. Uh, from other uh, governmental sources and private. Um, we expect that in 45 to 60 days that that would be complete. Uh, but that's just the first step of what we would ultimately bring uh, forward. We're also reviewing our standard uh, lease template contract terms uh, with a goal towards uh, streamlining negotiations with the major telcos uh, so we don't run into you know key sti sticking points at the same point in the contract every time. Um, and also we'll be looking at digital inclusion, working with um, the Office of Civic Innovation uh, to, to layer in that component uh, before we take it. So we're looking at uh, the goal of bringing it to council uh, in calendar year 2021. Great, okay, that's good to know. And depending on how far down the road you go on some of those topics, it might be worth cross-referencing or, or presenting to the Smart Cities Committee at some point. I think you're, you're talking about some really interesting opportunities there. So um, thanks thanks for sharing a little more detail. And uh, that's all I had, Chair. Thank you. And, and Kevin, uh, Chair, if, you, if I may, just want to add two things to that. Um, the the In addition to the inventory, getting access to a, a more um, sophisticated right now we use spreadsheets to manage our properties and that's really old and not effective and the goal of having everyone using the same management system they can lock it down so nobody else gets in but to be uh, so we can harness and aggregate data is something we we very very much want to see and we've also been in contact with it so that Rob and Jerry would put us on their priority list in order because the existing systems that everybody has are different. And so they'll have to be bridge programming in order to get everybody on the same platform. That, that's very key. And then I also thank you, just wanted to highlight one other thing. We're, we're working hand in glove with innovation um, for many reasons. One, we want to, from our broader communications, having macros, and the development of cells informing each other for straight up communications is really important. And then yes, very much wanna be smart about how we advance digital inclusion. And I'll, I'll thank you. Uh, and I'll just add at Smart Cities, we actually discussed 5G location and communication, better communication to our community because that is something that we hear about regularly, but that's not the purpose of the this particular uh, audit report. Um, next, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Just a couple of questions. I appreciate the work on this. Um, so it was mentioned around um, having a management sophomore uh, platform, and I was curious if this data will be something would be made available to the public. I know we get uh, constituents that have asked before whether something is city owned property or not. And our office has to go, you know, obviously go through real estate and, and bog down time, I think, to try and figure out that info. And having this data be open um, would be really helpful. Is that something we expect to be open to the public? That that would be the intent. The goal, all of this are public properties. And so the data should be public as well. Um, it, 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 at the moment, it's just super hard to assemble. Okay. And then um, in regards to the recommendation of reform, working with other departments to coordinate uh, maintenance on vacant properties, it kind of talked about obviously that, that challenge of, of uh, needing to be able to, to, to communicate and work together a little better. Um, it talks about the, the data um, itself as far as the data collection portion. Is that all we need to better coordinate or is there something else that we are going to need to do to be better coordinating between um, departments or is, is that data collection portion gonna solve that problem for us? Kevin, if I may start and then you can clean up. Um, 
which I, first would be the data. We're going to use ourselves as guinea pigs so that we can demo and show the other departments. We have we're in the process of going through an RFP um, as and we're linking with finance based on the financial records. The system would do both, and the other departments are going to have to do that as well. Anybody with leases or property. Um, so there's a there's a good you, you know a challenge we're turning trying to turn into a good thing, um, and once we are up and running, the goal is to create that contract so that there's room for programming so that each could come on. But to, to get specifically to what you were thinking through, council member, we believe there will be more that we need to do. For example, there will be opportunities to cross cut our budget requests. Um, for maintenance with better informed data. Um, and, and we believe in terms of availability of certain facilities, there will be other things that once we're looking in aggregate more holistically that will result from this. Kevin, what would you add? I would add uh, that we are um, constantly coordinating with other departments around uh, our, our property management. And having the data there would cut down on unnecessary, uh, you know, time that we're spending on that coordination, uh, and also potentially empower uh, decision makers, especially in other departments that may not realize everything about a property. Um, you know, to have that at the fingertips uh, when they're looking at a property record uh, could just overall enhance the uh, the city's management there. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot that will need to remain kind of coordinated human to human, um, even with the database. And we wouldn't want to have the database and then fall uh, away into our silos and lose that close connection, that, that um, uh, human connection that we do have now, because I think that's working. We just need to empower it with the with better data. So my only feedback is just given this recommendation number four, the, the wording of it with talking about needing to work with other departments to coordinate the maintenance on vacant properties. And obviously the data collection tool seems to be a big portion of it. But when I read the, the administration's response on this, I just didn't see anything called out on that work of how are you going to coordinate uh, you know, better between departments. And it, and it felt like uh, reading it that that, you know, that uh, data collection tool is, is really what's going to help. But it sounds like that's not totally the case. And I, I think really just reading the last line of the, the admin response says real estate will work with other departments to standardize data and facilitate cross referencing between departments. Still, you know, still kind of pointed back to that data. I, I guess I would just ask if that we maybe explain that a little better. Um, so then that way we know what it is that staff is actually planning on doing to, to you know, cure that portion of it, which is this coordination. The explanation you provided is helpful, but it's just not, uh, it's not written. So it's, it's not very clear in, in what obviously we have uh, reported out and then, uh, you know, clearly a month, you know, and then several years from now, when we look back at these, we're only going to be looking at what's written in the report. And so that I, I think that that could get lost. Thank you, council member. We'll flesh that out before this comes forward to council. Thank you. That's it for me. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I just have a couple of questions and then I'll, I'll entertain a motion from uh, my, my committee members. I, I, I think it's great that we have, are we striving to have one database and one access to, and access to the, da to the database and to um, echo council member paralysis question about public access to the, our real estate holdings would be really beneficial to us. It would save us as a council office time. Not that we don't want to help our constituents, we absolutely do, but if they can gain access and use it themselves, it, it uh, takes the control to them and then they can make the decision what, uh, what other information they need. In, in looking at the, um, the report that we get from our current database, it looks like, and I'm looking on page 19 of the audit, uh, and, and back up a little bit, 
uh, Joe, I want to thank you and your team for the audit. As always, it's really well written, really easy to follow. And then uh, staff's follow up uh, on uh, their, their responses to it. Thank you as well. I always enjoy getting an audit report because it really helps me understand exactly what's going on and your findings are always um, really useful uh, and on point to what I'm starting to think about. So with regards to the report or the, the, uh, the current, yeah, this is, this is the one, kind of hard to read now, but that's okay. There's no values associated with that. Do we someplace in a database, um, and I'm not sure if this is something we need public or not, we certainly need public access to some of this information, but do we have any sense of values for each of these pieces of real estate? I understand that some of them are remnants and some of them may be more substantial than that. Some may be our parks. There's a whole variety of real estate holdings that the city owns, but is there any value connected to them? Is there any place we can go to say, oh, this is the value of our real estate holdings? Or will this be a result of the database? Well, Council Member, the rea and, and I know that touching on your 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 business as well, um, valuation is a certain process, and it fluctuates mm -hmm. sometimes quite a bit with movements in the market. Sure. So, so for the city's time and money, it makes sense that when one of those properties are in a potentially thought about being reused by somebody not part of the city or for sale, then that's the time that we would evaluate, uh, but not on a global basis. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to clarify my question. I'm actually not asking you to go out and value each of these parcels. That would be time consuming and extremely expensive. But the, they all have parcel numbers and the assessor assigns values. Do they not, I, I'm not as familiar with an assessor signing values to publicly owned properties, but does the assessor assign value to publicly owned property too? No. Okay, so, all right. So, so much for that question. I was going to send us in that direction to the tax assessor and we'd be able to figure it out by simply auto-populating from their database to ours. Right. But if they don't uh, assign values, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Can I just jump in? So one sure. thing we do note, uh, you know, so the finance department maintains fixed asset schedules for financial statement purposes, which we, this was another one of the databases that we, we, I, we, I noted earlier. Um, so that, and in total, the book value, which is basically the original purchase price less uh, depreciation is around 3 billion overall. That's all of the city's property, including all the revenue generating and everything else. Um, one of the questions, and it get, gets, when, when I said it's just when I the first part of the discussion when I said that we have multiple databases there it's hard to kind of walk from one to the other you know within the fixed asset databases sometimes there's APNs sometimes there's not in some cases uh, you can crosswalk from one database to the other um, you know improvements to land or improvements to buildings might be have multiple lines within the fixed asset database so this is again just one of the challenges of trying to understand if, if we're looking up a property, uh, you know, one of the pieces that's hard to kind of crosswalk, you know, I can't remember what the number is, but the, you know, the, we looked at the, the 25 properties we selected, um, only a handful of them, we could, we could walk back to the, uh, the fixed assets, fixed asset schedules and easily identify. Now, it doesn't mean we couldn't identify down the road, but, you know, in our, in our limited work, it, it was, it was a real challenge to try to Walk crosswalk across the different databases uh, with these, with the different whether it was land vision uh, data that Kevin and, and, and Nancy use, or it's the facilities database or the master address database or the fixed asset schedules. It's hard, um, yeah. and so that's the kind of the basis for getting this data in one place. And hopefully, we can get some of that at least the uh, the book value information into the database as well. Great, thank you, and. Uh... Just one real final question regarding the the new database, I'll call it. Is there, a, I assume there's budget implication. Are we uh, believing we can find the money somewhere to pay for a new database? 
to me, it seems critical that we have a database that has allows the departments who access re our real estate holdings to have access to one database. But is there, do we have any idea what that might be, what it might cost? Or the, I, I know that'll come back to us, but just to get an idea. So, so Kevin, I'll give you the particulars, but we do indeed have money reserved and we are also uh, partnering with finance uh, to accomplish the task. Kevin, do you have the more specific numbers at your fingertips? We're setting aside as of right now about 160,000 for the first year and then about 30,000 ongoing uh, after that for uh, the subscription costs. Um, but we haven't, the, the RF hasn't gone out yet. So we, we haven't seen what the market uh, provides us. So we, we, we don't know with certainty. Great, okay, wonderful. Thank you again for the report. Is there a motion? Anyone care to make a motion? So moved. I'll move. I'll, uh, I'd, I'd like to just add that that uh, update if staff can clarify on that response number four, but that's it. Okay. So I'll, I'll second if, if uh, you're okay with that, Councilor. I'm, I'm, I'm on board. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> okay, good. Let's vote. Carrasco? Corrales? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Esparza? <laughs> yes. Foley? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. I see that. Okay, let's okay. go back to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, can you give us an update on economic development? I feel things are happening in the city. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. I do apologize for being late, jumping on the meeting. Um, I, I was having a little bit of a Zoom meltdown there and was apparently <laughs> attending the wrong meeting. <laughs> you happens, weren't there. Happens I to was. all of us. <laughs> <laughs> I do apologize. Um, no worries. Thank you. Elizabeth Hambler, the uh, Public Information Manager for the Office of Economic Development. As always, in the time of COVID, it has been a busy month in OED with our joint um, responsibilities for managing business outreach in a general sense and also working on behalf of DOC on recovery activities. So I'll run through our items for the June uh, newsletter, starting with our much anticipated and always welcome uh, project development report that um, brings us up to date with a listing of the um, key projects that we're following in terms of development, construction under uh, review. And um, this has an attachment of a downloadable PDF that lists each of the properties considered with all the details more than anybody would probably need about each one of the properties and also a, a project map that helpfully lays out these projects on a geographical um, framework. Um, the good news is that we are still experiencing um, a strong interest in both investment in real estate opportunities and fulfillment of that investment potential in terms of development. With um, 12,000 housing units uh, plus in, in the construction sector, 1.19 million square feet of retail space, and 16.3 million square feet of office space under development. Um, and then there's additional units of uh, retail and office and hotel rooms that are actually under construction right now. So please check our blog post for all that information. We did an update this month on the uh, general recovery activities that we have been implementing towards the business sector. And in this case, pretty much the smaller and mid-sized businesses, those that were the most penalized by the restrictions on business operations um, during the pandemic period. Um, and by nature and by the evidence of it, it's, it's the smaller businesses and it's the ones that are mostly customer facing and the ones that were considered non-essential. In other words, not grocery stores, not pharmacies, but the flower shops, the restaurants, the small retailers. Um, 
we, we did an awful lot in terms of working through administering specifically direct grants from uh, that the city was arranging with some partners, including the mayor's office, Opportunity Fund, and others. That was some six point six, almost six point one million dollars in direct grants, and they were very focused on the um, the most COVID impacted zip codes in the city. We made um, a lot of effort to be sure that those businesses were going to be getting the majority of the money. Um, throughout San Jose, we were able to help, not influence, but help um, a large number of, of San Jose businesses to receive Paycheck Protection Program funding to the tune of $1.1 billion just in the San Jose area. So we're really pleased with that, having been able to help that infusion of funds. We've also been doing an awful lot of communication, um, blog posts, um, e-blasts to our 40,000 uh, person list of emergency contacts to our business community. Um, and we've been working very hard on expanding and holding our commitment to multilingual communications throughout. And we have a very long blog post that has all those details that um, in case you want to dig down into whatever we've been doing, it's there. Uh, we promoted the city's Can You Balance the City's Budget Test uh, to this was a blog post that ran before. The, this is now not active anymore, but it was something we did promote last month before the um, program ended. Um, really fun little exercise in all four languages. We were excited to be able to uh, be part of an um, Inter interactive and informational session that the government of Australia put on for their local startup, as they call it, young businesses who are interested in creating a presence in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, of course. And we were pleased to be able to be part of that and to share the advantages that San Jose specifically offers to those businesses. So we hope to see some Aussies coming, coming over soon. We're really pleased to be able to uh, launch a video, the first of a series of vignettes that we're going to be producing um, on success stories of businesses in San Jose that have been able to weather and survive and in some ways learn from the, the pandemic experience. And the first one we, in our series is Luna's Mexican Kitchen um, that not only managed to survive but managed to open um, a enormous new restaurant in the Prune Yard during the course of the pandemic. And uh, Joe Lopez, the co-owner of the, of the restaurants, um, is an amazing spokesperson. We're really pleased to have this video to share. I mean, it's attached to both the newsletter and to the uh, blog post notes on our YouTube channel. Finally, many of you were there for the opening of Good Spot, um, which was uh, one of the more exciting almost heart-stopping opening events that I've been to. Um, it was quite exciting. And um, I, can't, I can't say enough about those lion dancers. I, 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 I'm still having flashbacks. Um, but it's an exciting addition to the SOFA district. Um, the, the, the mayor and uh, Council Member Perales and Council Member Foley all mentioned how um, how exciting it is that we had as many new businesses open during this pandemic in Sosa and in other parts of downtown. And this is certainly one of the more ambitious ones. So we are hoping that they will be able to, um, to survive and thrive. And that's the end of the report. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate that. Turning to members of the public, caller user number one, please unmute yourself. Hey, thanks for you know let, letting me on again. Uh, economic recovery, not going to happen. The county just put something in where they're going to be tracking every single person's COVID shots. And they're basically harassing owners of businesses in Santa Clara County, that would include us, San Jose, about people getting their COVID, their, their COVID vaccinations. How is that going to help drive business? They're, now these, these businesses, with all that happened with COVID, they're going to have to keep tabs on their employees to be able to tell the county who has the vaccine and who doesn't. 
that's just going to be bleeding profits out of these businesses that are already struggling, especially these restauranteurs and these places in an already pretty much defunct downtown before COVID. So what makes you think that keeping tabs on people, this is like the secret police. I mean, am I going to have to keep a, a COVID vaccine card around my neck? Are, are they going to shake down businesses that aren't complying with COVID? This is going to make a lot of places go out of business. I'm not going to be able to, to have the databases to handle what, what this takes for all their employees micromanaging their employees with a vaccine card, then someone from the county who never shows up for anything is going to show up to your business and, 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 and harass you? How is that going to give us economic development? I'd like anyone in that forum today to answer that question. How on earth do you think that this is all going to be good? And it's about time that you guys thought about business development in the downtown quarter that place looked like detroit uh way before covid ever started i mean it and you guys want to build villages all over the place you guys got to prove to me that you could actually make a vibrant downtown and you can't fairmont closed movie theater closed safeway closed all you guys want to do is get rid of parking down there and build more bike lanes to give people citations how on earth is that going to help economic development? I'd like to hear a little bit more of a plan than a two-minute uh, lip service I was just given. I didn't learn anything. Blair Beekman. Hi. To try to comment on the, uh, on the agenda, on the memorandum uh, presentation itself, uh, the items on it. Uh, for small business uh, development ideas you, that you're working on, I wanted to remind that uh, at the county level, you know, they're, they're offering uh, business loans for COVID issues, and uh, it sounds like an interesting process. Uh, the, the small business, I don't know if they're loans or if it's actual, may, it might actually be just uh, funding for small businesses uh, you can ask about. Um, it also includes uh, for small businesses to inquire about HVAC systems and what uh, is being called uh, how to offer uh, air quality systems as a part of their as as a part of the HVAC systems. And um, I'm I'm learning the language. Hopefully that's the good language how to, to speak about it. And uh, it's available at the county level for small businesses. And uh, I just thought I'd offer that here at this time. Um, what was the other item about? It was 57 seconds. Um, there was uh, items about uh, housing and what, what do we consider with housing. I can give I can give you my usual speech that I will I'll talk more about in the next uh, few items that, uh, you know, ELI, VLI, and uh, mixed income, especially mixed income to myself are incredibly important ideas. Um, you know, it's not enough just to ask for affordable housing, but to, uh, you know, really consider how we're going to help people who really, really need housing. Um, and to conclude, you know, with so many new units being placed in the new flea market, I hope uh, vendors and the vendors union can really, really have a part and a, and a more important voice in how that flea market area will be developed. If it is developed, it doesn't have to be developed, but if it is, let the vendors make the decisions how it can be developed. It'd be a lot more organic and pretty and saner and uh, good luck in those efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Turning back to the committee, are there any comments about the or questions about the economic report? If not, oh, Magdalena, I'm sorry, Council Member Carrasco. I thank you so much. Uh, on on page two of the of the attachment, um, it it mentions um, the east side of San Jose. If you could give me some uh, some some more details on those efforts. So I don't know how much of those six million dollars went to to the uh, small businesses on the east side, and I don't know if you actually have those those numbers. Elizabeth, you're on mute. We can't hear you. I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, Councilmember Carrasco, we do have 
have those figures and they are in the blog post. I will pull that up and forward it to you um, right now by email, if that's okay. I don't have it right in front of me. Yeah, um, aside from the numbers, uh, do you do you have a, a, an idea of, uh, of how many businesses have closed or how many are still hanging on and what the need is? You know, and the reason why I ask is because I, I've sent out my team to go uh, work <coughs> and have a conversation with some of the, the businesses. But of course, my team is very small and it's very difficult to to really have a, um, to really have a, a bigger picture. Uh, and, and it would be very helpful to have city support when it comes to really getting a bigger picture of, uh, of how our, our small businesses are doing in some of these uh, uh, underserved communities. Uh, you know, if I had more, if I had more uh, staff, <laughs> uh, I, I could do a better job, but, but it's very, very difficult to get to, to all these businesses. Council member, let me just say thank you for the question. It's Nancy. Um, we struggle with data on this a bit as well. So for example, we, we know that 40% of businesses close their doors. We're looking for the data, working on data sets uh, to determine how many are reopening. So part of that is with data sets that lag a little bit. So as we get information, we will absolutely share that with you. Do you know, do you, I, I guess, you know, it, it would be helpful as we're trying to make these decisions in terms of how we're going to support businesses and how we're also uh, uh, looking at the ARP funding that's coming through and how we're going to uh, uh, create some support systems for our businesses. Uh, you know, we can only, uh, we can only uh, assume uh, just from what we're hearing and, and the conversations that we're having, uh, you know, as I'm driving down the street, uh, you know, the the doors that are, have been closed and the lights that are out. So, you know, we make assumptions from that. Uh, but, you know, to have a more accurate information in terms of some of the businesses that are at least right now still hanging on and, and having an idea of of those businesses that are hanging on, hanging on, which of those businesses could benefit from our additional support? That would that information would be helpful in us making uh, uh, that kind of investment in whether it's financial investment, technical support, what have you. Um, uh, you know, th that kind of information is really vital at this point. You know, we have a, a downtown business manager that has a better indication of what's happening downtown, but we don't have that in Little Saigon. We don't have that on the east side of San Jose. We don't have that in the business district up in uh, Evergreen. Uh, we don't have that in, in, in fact, council member Foley has said, you know, she's got businesses also outside of the downtown area. We, we don't have uh, uh, any sort of indication other than what we kind of intuitively no, uh, but it would be great to be able to have some sort of real time data, um, not just of the businesses that are closed, but those businesses that are hanging on, that if we knew, if we injected them with support, technical support, financial support, that we would know, hey, they're going to be okay. They're going to survive, or they're going to at least be able to hang on a little bit longer until we can get people back through their doors, and then they're not going to be dependent on us. Um, you know, I, I think that that would be really helpful so that we can make some intelligent decisions when it comes to the kind of investments we're going to be making or the kinds of decisions we're going to be making over the next several weeks. So that's one. Uh, the other is, um, what was the other question I had? Give me a second. Um, in your report, give me just a second. I, I just lost it right now. So, so, uh, so I know you have some, some of that info, but I don't know if you have the other info that I'm asking for. 
Council member, um, difficult to get particularly the businesses that are hanging on. There, there are no clear mechanisms. Um, mostly we're working on relationships with people who like um, Jose Flores, who are working well in their, their area, the Opportunity Fund, which spreads out across the city so that we're getting a sense of the issues and the magnitude. Um, we'll, we'll have a more immediate uh, success on data from brokers, knowing on what vacancies are, as well as the quarterlies on business license and other data sets that we're, we're looking to. We're also looking at credit card data uh, for the first time, which is a little bit more reliable. And, and I'll go back and talk to staff, council member, because um, based on revenues, we may get an indication of pre- and current that could tell us what range they're in. So I'll, I will get back to you. We'll ask about that. Uh, that would be helpful. And, and then uh, as you're doing that, can I, uh, I'd like to know what, and maybe you already have this information, but, uh, but of course there's going to be a very big issue that's coming before the council. It's already gone to the planning commission. And that's the, the whole issue with the vendors at the flea market. And Mr. Beekman just brought it up. And I'm, I'm grateful that he did because it would have, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to seize this opportunity. But do we know what the economic impact is of the vendors? My understanding, it's anywhere between 400 to 700 vendors that are there uh, during the week. And then it increases on the weekends. And then, of course, we have uh, the number of vendors that uh, have even just the temporary uh, permits that um, are not the long-term uh, tenants there. But what is the economic impact that they, uh, that they uh, contribute um, to the, this region? Uh, and how can, we, uh, how can we get that? Council member, before, I, I, I just wanna interrupt. Um, a minute. I know this is that item is coming before council, so I'm a little hesitant to have any discussion about this, lest it violate any sort of Brown Act. Um, I I don't know that it does. I'm just sensitive to the discussion, and, and if sure it doesn't, we can proceed. So we have Johnny fans on. Johnny, are we okay continuing in this conversation? Yeah, we're, we're okay. Okay. We're okay. I I, ju I just. I yeah, just overly so sensitive. I, I, Sorry. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. This is, uh, you know, we're not talking about policies or anything. We, I, I want to get some information on. Uh, no, no worries. Economic, I just want to make sure. Yeah, economic development and this, you know, four to seven hundred vendors is a huge economic uh, impact on the city of San Jose, in my opinion, and also in terms of uh, 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 supporting our small businesses. Uh, so, and, and, and we are having a public discussion without violating anything. So, uh, so Nancy, how do I get uh, the, uh, the report on economic impact of these four to 700 um, vendors? Council member, thank you very much. I don't have the number right with me. We will get you the number on what sales tax is generally reported. Um, I believe that it's closer in an overall number of vendors, 450 uh, approximately vendors um, with licenses, with, with um, um, leases, leases. leases uh, there. Thank you. And I know I was going to ask you, Rosalind, if that's correct, but we'll get back with the number. You know, we want to acknowledge that we don't necessarily have the best number only because a lot of that, and this, this I'm just saying is a matter of information. It's not in any way a judgment. Uh, a, a lot of the business that tends to get done at the flea market is cash, cash only. So there isn't always a reflection uh, of the transactions. But we, we will look to see what we do have record of and, and assure that you get it and or include that with for um, Rosalind when she, uh, her staff, planning staff, takes the item to council. And we also get uh, the, 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 uh, the revenues that are generated per spaces 
if it's 450 spaces that are licensed and they're long-term tenants, I'm sure that uh, that we can get that right because that's that's those are funds that are being generated as well. So those would generally, I believe, be shared as property tax. Uh, sorry, as sales tax, council member, as the revenue. We we wouldn't know. City wouldn't have access to the amount of fees that the facility is paying either in parking fees or install fees. That isn't something that the city would know. Um, and the only piece that we'd have to look into, council member, in terms of sales tax generated, we believe that there are um, vendors have multiple stalls. And so we could hopefully get you the information by individual vendor or their business as a vendor, but not necessarily by stall. No, but I mean, uh, the recipient of those fees that are paid per stall, as well as the parking revenues that are being received. Those are only held by the owner. Those are not, those are not dollars that come to the city. So taxes aren't paid on those parking revenues and on the, on the Ah, I see. I see what you're saying. I, I, I would have to look and see what uh, we have from time to time, council member, um, over the years looked at vendor information. I don't know what information other than the aggregate information of the vendors would actually be available to the city based on what the bum family receives. So I, I, I will, I will check and, and um, follow up rather than take your time here. So, uh, so, in, uh, so I guess the follow-up question to that is, as we're looking at economic development and small uh, uh, micro grants or what uh, you know, uh, business support, are we reaching out to these vendors and supporting them as well? So, so a couple of different things, and and this I'm I'm speaking in large part for myself here. Um, this item will come uh, that that city staff will bring forward. It will be we, the the only good part, if I may say, good part is that there will be time. There there nothing is going to happen on the flea market in the near term, the next couple of years at earliest. So there is some time to work through issues. There'll be more issues that the developer and their consultants on how that um, flea market has expanded that is being uh, made space for can be laid out and how many vendors can be accommodated um, as well as city OED all shares your concern about the issue. And we're, we're looking toward the opportunity to um, go after grants or additional funds uh, uh, we don't believe out of this first ARP uh, American Rescue Plan, we don't believe the, the, the MBA you'll see will cover funds particularly for the vendors. It, those will be directed to other areas. And again, the need will probably be most great a couple years from now if and when they're moving. But we are, A, wanting to get a partner on site to give us much more information about the vendors themselves, because that would help us um, a great deal to understand the characteristics, um, who's on site and what do they need kind of information. And then secondly, to be able to, to, to see how we could uh, go after funds to be of use. Yeah, the, uh, great, I'm, I'm glad. Um... <laughs> We'll be looking at that uh, for future uh, support. But the question I had is in terms of uh, the support that we've been able to provide businesses over the last uh, you know, months uh, during this hardship that the pandemic has, uh, has posed, uh, were we also able to reach out to vendor, vendors like at the flea market and, and support them? Because I imagine that as we were sheltering in place, vendors were no exception and were suffering great mm -hmm. hardship as well, yep. uh, including, you know, paleteros, uh, you know, taco vendors and people who, who had licenses as well. Uh, were they also recipients? These are not your normal, typical, you know, uh, uh, business owners that you would, you know, think of, you know, being within a building 
uh, you know, but they are still business owners. And these are probably people who, who are, are having a very difficult time because of the kind of uh, business that they have. And so I don't know, and, and I, I'm, I'm just asking the question because I, I don't necessarily know what kind of uh, conditions they happen to be in. I would imagine that they probably are very disconnected from the information unless we're doing active and aggressive outreach to them. Uh, but because they're mobile, uh, they may not necessarily get the information and we may not always know exactly where they are, you know, uh, but uh, just wondering if they're also uh, uh, recipients of grants and uh, uh, micro loans or whatever it is that's available to them. Uh, are, have, ha, do we have data uh, available to us that says, uh, hey, you know, these folks also were recipients of, you know, $300,000 in, in the aggregate? So I will go back and get more detail. What I know to begin with is that there has been some outreach, certainly to allow the Bum family to know what uh, information is available. But especially when the when the vendors are not on site, we, we don't have access to emails or addresses in order to communicate with them directly. So we were, again, going through either the Bums or other third parties who, who would interact with, with the vendors. And council member, if, if I could you know, add. I, I have to tell you that's really concerning. If they've got a business license, then they've gotten the information through the information that comes through a business license. Um, not all the vendors have business licenses, mm -hmm. but if they've got a, a, a business license, then they have definitely had repeated um, efforts at outreach um, through that channel, as well as channels of groups that we know that engage with them. But is we it, don't have direct otherwise. Is, is that because the outreach was done through through mail? To, um, email um, through through the, uh, which is some, like you're grimacing, which I'm, sh I'm agreeing with, because the, the business license, it's the contact information, and sometimes it's phone numbers, and sometimes it's email. So through business license, there were people calling, but it's, it is limited. What, so, so we know that uh, that our communities of color, and I'm telling you this because I represent the district that I represent, and emails do not work. We understand. And so I do snail mail, uh, and I I spend a lot of money on uh, that postage. I just have to. And my team goes in once a week, and they stuff envelopes by hand. I, I'm texting to see if the team was sending out to, to um, snail mail, as you said. Uh, so if I can get the information during the, the item, I will share it. And, and so I, 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 I hope that there was some effort to put something in the mail. Uh, if we're truly going to do outreach to truly support our folks, uh, then we have to meet them where they are. Uh, that, member, can I can I share something with you that we are doing? Um, and believe me, your your points are so well taken, and and we've been working really hard to try to figure out, especially when there were so many restrictions on face to face contact. Even if you put the information on a piece of paper, you can't physically hand it to someone. And so we are preparing right now a a snail mail. Um, flyer that includes all the information that we have right now on the available funding sources, um, the sources for health order information, uh, local community organizations that are in the business of helping directly one-on-one -on -one with businesses to support them with legal and other kinds of information. It's all on a, a very large, very busy two-page info packed flyer that we've developed in five languages. Um, and we're doing a mailing to 21,000 businesses in the city of San Jose between two and 35 employees. And this is all the businesses in San Jose 
is with fewer than 35 employees. So, you know, there are businesses that we have uh, developed relationships with and or just have bought it on maps or on uh, the finance business tax registration list. We think it would be even farther than the business tax registration list. We're doing everything we can to kind of scrape business contact info. Um, and so we're doing that. This will be doing, completed before the end of June. Uh, Jim, do Thank you for that. Uh, and, and, and this, so if, if they have a license, they will get a... Maybe email. even if they don't have a license, we're using some proprietary databases to try to reach every business with fewer than 35 employees, okay. regardless of their business tax status. Okay. So this includes the vendors at the flea market? We hope so. We definitely hope so. We can't tell from just looking at the list. It's, it's a name and it's an address. And we, we don't necessarily know the exact nature of their business. They may just be listed as retail. But okay. it's down to, to, to businesses with two employees. Um, uh, but uh, but this, this will be the first mail out in, in the last 14 months since the pandemic started? It's the first mail. It's the first time that we've been able to assemble this list, yes. But, but we, we believe there's, a, that's why I'm double checking. I believe the list went out to the business license by snail mail previously, but we, we will check that council member um, to make sure we're giving you accurate information. Maybe you could get back to us with that information. Yeah, yeah. It, and so the, the uh, I'll just close off by, by saying this because I see other folks who want to speak. Uh, you know, again, uh, you know, even when they write down an email, we know that a lot of members from our community, they just, they don't have either accurate emails or it's not, um, it's not a tool that's readily used in, uh, in, in much of our communities of color for different reasons. Uh, and we saw, we saw firsthand that when, when we were sheltering in place, our kiddos were disconnected for at least six months in some areas of the city of San Jose. If that weren't the case, we would not have invested the kind of capital that we did in our communities in order to make sure that our kiddos were reconnected we wouldn't have uh, we wouldn't have made the push for hotspots. We wouldn't have uh, uh, made sure that uh, that we had this kind of capital investment. That's just one aspect of it. It's a very complex reason for it. Then there has to be a cultural shift in the way that we do business. And I'm not saying that that's true for everybody. A lot of a lot of our folks are starting to really understand the value in it. But nonetheless, when you are bombarded with a lot of uh, spam, a lot of uh, junk mail, uh, I am I'm guilty of it. I don't I don't sift through all my junk. Uh, and so, if it if it doesn't look familiar, if it doesn't look uh, uh, even important or, or somehow stands out, there, there's no reason to look through it when you're running a business. So, you know, I, I just would hope that when there's a, a small business such as even like a, a, a vendor, like those in the flea market or, or you know, those that are lining my street on Story Road and, and uh, White Road, that we would really do everything that we could in our power to make sure that they have the resources and the funding that's available to them, uh, that's meant to keep them alive during a very, very difficult time. That way we don't have to worry about getting them rent relief or get them to stand in line for uh, food distribution or school supplies because they could buy it on their own. They can survive on their own. They have their own job. They can go ahead and be self-sustained. That's what we want at the end of the day. We don't That's want what we share. We want that very much. And so, uh, so I hope I, I can get that information and, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I'm, I'm also looking forward to getting that information in terms of the economic impact 
that the four to 700 is what I've heard also, uh, are the number of vendors at the flea market, as well as uh, the fees that are paid uh, uh, you know, during the weekend on the weekends, uh, long-term vendors, as well as the, the temporary uh, permit holders. Um, and I think that we can get that as well as the parking fees. Um, thank you so much, Chair. Great, thank you. Rosalind, you, I'm sorry, Council Member Esparza, Rosalind had her hand raised and then she put it down. Did you wanna make a point or shall I go to Council Member Esparza? Thank you, Chair. I'll just make a real quick point because we certainly appreciate the discussion around small businesses and vendors um, that are located in places like the flea market and just wanted to remind the committee um, that the small business recovery item is in the recently approved city roadmap. And so staff will be planning to bring to the CED committee um, information on our work around small business recovery, also how it ties into the community and economic task force that will get established um, as directed by council. So we will be planning throughout the next fiscal year to bring in you information and updates on staff's work. Great. Thank you. Council Member Esparza. Thank you. And um, I know we have a lot to cover, so I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I, I wanted to thank uh, Council Member Carrasco for bringing up these issues. I think um, both the small business outreach issue as well as the vendors of the flea market issue. And there are a few things that, um, that you know, I'm seeing in common and they shouldn't be new. Um, the economic development team has been out and I'd uh, like to give a special shout out to Sal and Boage, um for uh, taking the efforts that they did. But, but there are a couple of things. Um, I pulled up the info memo from July 7th that had the um, $6 million um, and the breakdown of what, you know, how, how we did outreach, um, who got the grants. And, um, and, and so two thirds of the grants went to, uh, what is it? Uh, 95122, 95116, 95127. Um, and then we also had grants go to 95112 and 95113 downtown. Um, but when I look at the outreach activities, they're very email based. Um, and as council member Carrasco said, just said, and um, I know from my own experience, um, the folks that are hurting the most, frankly, need a personal touch. Um, and, uh, and, and when I look at the July 7th info memo that gives more detail, um, we do depend on grassroots partners, I believe is the term that we used. Um, and we talked about ethnic chambers, neighborhood business districts, um, nonprofit community-based organizations. And, and the fact is they're stretched as well. And, and, and they may not, um, I know from my own experience in my district, um, you know, one of them didn't use the personal touch because they were swamped and I guess nobody thought to ask. So, so they actually went through, and this is the, the second commonality that I wanted to highlight from uh, Council Member Carrasco, which is um, the third party, going through a third party. And that, that one organization in my district went through a third party um, that didn't have a positive relationship with the businesses there. And so, and, and I think, you know, um, in the, whether it's, um, a neighborhood in any part of San Jose, or whether it's the flea market situation, um, we really need to facilitate that direct communication with folks um, because other third parties, um, and I'm talking about landlords especially, uh, have that relationship is fraught with issues, particularly right now in the economic situation that people are dealing with right now. And, um, and so I just wanted to highlight those things. Our folks need that personal touch. And I've said this before, I, I personally and my team personally, we went door to door in different parts of my districts, including Grand Century Mall, Vietnam Town, 
in La Placita at King and Story. So no matter what your ethnic background, right, no matter your language, um, there were some very, very small businesses and some, some larger small businesses, right? They really don't do business on email, <laughs> right? And, and I was kind of surprised because I, I mean, I talked to some folks that run some, you know, very successful small businesses and have been around a long time. And I, and I asked them, you know, what's the best way to reach you? And it's um, phone and in person, really is, is what I was told. Um, and so, um, so our small but mighty economic development team, um, it doesn't have the bandwidth. I mean, we are mighty. We do do a lot with a small number of folks, but we really need to look at the resources um, available and design our outreach methods and contracts to provide that type of contract oversight and management acknowledging that our folks need a personal touch and we shouldn't really be going through third parties like landlords. We really, you know, should be trying to be as direct as possible. And then with the backup with maybe another community-based nonprofit or something like that, but, but whether it's the flea market or um, storing King, um, I think these are some, uh, some universals that we're hearing throughout the city. Um, and I hope that as we move forward, as Rosalind just mentioned, we acknowledge those realities um, and take that into account. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you, and, and I agree with you on the communication. It's small business owners don't necessarily pay attention to their emails. They're trying to run their operation. And the last thing they really want to do is respond to an email from the city uh, unless there's money attached and small businesses don't know that there might be a money attached. So I, I absolutely concur with you on that. All right, um, so we do have a couple more reports. Is there a motion to accept this report? To accept. Is second. There a second. Okay, can you poll the um, members please? Can you call for the, uh, let's call for the vote. Yes. Carrasco. Thank you. Aye. Morales. Yes. Mayhan. Aye. Esparza. Yes. And Foley. Aye. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Moving on to the next report, which is the Work to Future annual report. Jeff Ruster, do you have a report for us? I do, and I am, um, I'm Jeff Ruster. I'm with the Office of Economic Development, and good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, I'm joined today by Monique Melchor, who is uh, heads up the Work to Future team. Um, in just a moment, she'll introduce some of her other team members. Um, and we're here today to present really three things. One is the kind of um, go provide an overview of operational highlights and new initiatives that we've been undertaking. Uh, number two, to discuss the impact of COVID on our local employment markets and the changes that we've done in, during the shelter in place and social distancing during the, the pandemic. And I think just as importantly, and maybe more importantly, particularly given the, the tenor of the conversation right now, um, how we will be changing our service delivery uh, method, where we will be delivering the services, and how we will be delivering those services. Um, I do want to highlight as I transition this over to, to Monique, um, that back in 2017, 2018, as we were approaching 50-year lows in the unemployment rate, um, Work the Future undertook a study which showed that 40% of households in our area were like one missed paycheck away from not meeting the rent, uh, the rent payments or mortgage payments or some other key key expense. And of course, those th th that 40% was really concentrated with the folks that Work to Future has historically served um, throughout the years. Um, and notwithstanding the fact that we've had about a 60% reduction in our federal budgets over the last seven or eight years, um, the team has done a, a great job in keeping their eye on the prize and serving those clients that mo most need our services. Um, so with that, let me transition it over to Monique. 
Hello, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Monique Melchor, as Jeff mentioned, and I am the director for Work to Future. With me from our office is Lawrence Thu. He's our strategic engagement manager, Elaine Malari, our finance manager, and Hung Tran. She's with our business services team. And I will be providing the regular update on Work to Future services for you today. I'm gonna to give you just a little bit of uh, operational highlights. As Jeff mentioned, we actually this last year received recognition from the state. Uh, we have been certified as a state designated high performing board again thank you met and this means we've met and exceeded uh, our performance measures uh, approved received approval for our local and regional plans we've met our required expenditures and created partnerships with businesses um, just fyi our program year starts july 1 and ends june 30th so we're about to begin a new program year this last year in your memo, it does have a, a technical typo. We actually served 1,985 individuals uh, with uh, two participants with at least one barrier. For our youth, they're primarily low income. For adult, adults, they're basic skills deficient and they reside in low resource census tract areas. And for our displaced workers, of course, they've been recently laid off. Our local and regional plans are due every two years. These plans drive our services towards creating a comprehensive system that impacts poverty, uh, promotes income mobility and equity in providing services. We are federally funded through the Department of Labor under the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, which we call WIOA. Work to Future serves the residents of San Jose, which is our biggest municipality, but we also serve the cities of Campbell, Gilroy, Los Altos Hills, Los Gatos, Monte Sereno, Morgan Hill, Saratoga, and the unincorporated areas of Santa Clara County. Of course, we're under the Office of Economic Development, and we contract our services through two providers, Equus and IRC. Again, uh, we have to meet because we're under the Department of Labor, 16 performance measures that we've met and exceeded uh, over the last 10 years, and which were included in your packet, attachment A. Uh, Lawrence, can you move to the next slide, please? Next slide, oh, thank you. So for Work to Future, um, what we call, or what I'm going to talk about a little bit is the pre-pandemic Work to Future. Uh, Silicon Valley, as you know, we have a, a huge dichotomy in regards to the individuals that we serve. But pre-pandemic, there were 1,000 Santa Clara County residents that were filing for unemployment insurance. 2.5 unemployment rate, which was great during that time, a 7.5% federal poverty rate, and the, of course, the median household income for Silicon Valley was at $132,444. Next slide, please. Now the COVID-19 impact, this is pandemic. In the middle of the pandemic, 49,000 individuals opened initial unemployment claims and that was just the first week. 530,000 additional claims were opened. The good thing is because we work with the state, we were able to receive weekly updates regarding UI information so that we'd be informed at a weekly uh, timeframe. 109,000 pandemic unemployment assistance or what the state called PUA was provided to business owners and business owners and those that were self-employed. So those that didn't regularly or couldn't uh, apply for the regular unemployment insurance. 51,000 jobs were lost in leisure and hospitality. We had record highs of 18.9% for Hispanics and 33% for youth. Unemployment among women reached a high of 16.1. Of course, childcare issues, primarily women had to stay at home to care for their children. They had to go to school um, because of the remote learning and no childcare was available in, in some regards. Additionally, for some anxiety about returning to the workforce, uh, the workplace, there were mental health issues and isolation, which led to anxiety and depression. Also contracting COVID-19 was also an impediment, but we knew people had to go back to work. Next slide. For 2019-2020, the key operational highlights are, and as I mentioned, 109, uh, 1,985 clients were served. 200 I'm so sorry, 2,158 was included in your packet, but um, that was including some individuals we served this year. For this year, we have served 856 and our year is not over yet. When the pandemic began, Work to Future worked side by side with the uh, uh, VLAC, the local virtual assistance center at the onset of the pandemic to engage with individuals to provide services remotely, to get people jobs because we knew that a lot of people were in need. 
So we made sure that we ramped up all our services and we had remote services up. And for those that didn't have access, we let them know about the library and taking advantage of the technical um, uh, devices that they had. We had a CARES work experience and training project that we worked on with CRF funding, which was provided to um, give individuals an opportunity to take advantage of work experience and training opp opportunities to assist those displaced workers um, during the pandemic. We actually assisted about 173 individuals. In San Jose Works, uh, we continue to provide those services to youth in coordination again with the library because everything had to be remote because of the pandemic. We didn't wanna put all our, our youth into risk. So they did remote work in in-demand jobs. Um, we had a 90% retention rate. Of course, our kids are the hardest to serve. 85% of those youth are of color. A hundred of them were placed in in-demand uh, employers uh, such as Cisco, Create, TV, Ignite, JP Graphics, NK Technologies, and Delta Machines, and they always have a great experience. It was a little, little different this year because of the re remote um, experience they had, but they flourished. This year, we're going to be doing a Facebook initiative that we are very, very excited about. Um, we launched this Facebook initiative with older uh, youth, and we're matching them to small businesses to incorporate digital marketing into their businesses. So, council member, um, as far as I think you mentioned that some individuals didn't even know about emails. That is so true. So we're gonna be having these youth go into those companies and teach those businesses how to get digital, how to become digital. So we're really excited about that. We also have something called the High Roads Construction Careers, also known as our top program, Trades Opportunity Program. And this is a trades program where they learned the multi-craft curriculum, MC3, to explore and find jobs in the trades, which has been a great opportunity for a lot of people. We also work with PG&E, it's called Power Pathways, to train and place workers with PG&E in utility maintenance and things of that nature. We also launched a prison to employment program um, where recently released individuals also take advantage of the MC3 program to get them into the trades. And then of course, with all these um, great initiatives that we have, we try to make sure that they're placed in uh, priority high growth, high waste jobs. Um, one example that we did was with a company called Evolve. There was an earn and learn aspect to it where participants were placed in a six week course with a community college. And it was an intro to smart manufacturing. And then they were placed in a job for eight weeks earning $18 an hour. Again, that was a work experience. At the end of that time, they actually all got permanent placement. So we were really excited about that. Uh, next slide, please. So again, as I mentioned, work to, future, work to Future focuses on high growth, high wage occupations for individuals in the following industries. So construction and trades is a big one. Uh, we've had placement at Acme Pacific Repairs, Alco Iron and Metal. We have people that have become cement masons, tile finishers, carpenters, sheet metal workers. Um, for advanced manufacturer, manufacturing, we placed them at KL Tencor, Unigen, Tesla. Healthcare, we've worked with employers such as Peninsula Family Services, Parktown Dental, for ICT information technology, uh, we work with US Tech Solutions and PayPal to find positions for these individuals. And then of course, we also look at besides our in-demand uh, industries, other in-demand jobs. So for an example, paralegal, we place an individual at Williams, Penelope and Cullen, PG&E, gas service representatives, Foster Thomas Inc, where they became a project manager. And then for entre entrepreneurships, we're doing the digital marketing with Facebook, which we are really excited about. It's gonna be launching soon. Next slide, please. And then moving forward, uh, we're gonna be targeting to the low resource census tracts from the 2021 map of data related to the Fair Housing Task Force provided by Councilwoman Esparza, thank you. Uh, the majority of tracts are in District 3, 5, and 7. So we'll be doing some multilingual face-to-face -face outreach with residents and partners. We can't wait to get out there and really get in those residences and let people know about the services because we're gonna be re relocating our one stop. We're, we're very excited about that. We're moving back to the east side. We're gonna be over on Las Plumas and we're going to this great center that we can't wait to be in. Um, so we'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, we're also gonna be wrapping up partnerships with the Office of Racial Equity, the library, PRNS to enhance connections for clients and their families, which include financial literacy, entrepreneurship, legal and employment services. And of course, as I mentioned a couple of times, we're going to continue to focus on our priority sectors, which are ICT, information technology, advanced manufacturing, healthcare, public sector, construction and trades, and business and finance. Um, next slide, please. So again, we're gonna be supporting extremely 
low income individuals, those that are basic skills deficient, um, we'll help them through earn and learn approaches. We have entry level incumbent worker training that we're going to be doing this year. We'll also be pursuing alternative funding sources, partnerships, and legislative opportunities to opportunities to expand our ability to serve non WIOA eligible populations, of course, and we do this every day convene with partners CBOs who can help uh, not only give our clients the services they need, but if there's a service that we don't have, we refer them to an entity that can provide citizenship services or other job readiness training and career counseling opportunities because uh, we don't have a one size fits all approach. We wanna make sure we're giving them what they need. We will also conduct periodic surveys, focus groups, one-on-one -on -one interviews with current and potential clients, clients rather WIA and uh, non-WIA to assess their Im the impact on the ongoing needs. And sorry if I took, spoke too fast, I kind of get a little uh, fast speaking when I'm in front of people, but that actually ends uh, the presentation to you all. Uh, if you wanna go to the next slide, Lawrence, if you have any questions, I, me and my team are here to answer them for you today. Wonderful, thank you, Monique. Mm -hmm. I will turn to, let's turn to the public first. We are talking about the Work to Future annual report. Mm -hmm. Caller user number one, you have two minutes. Please unmute. There you go. I'm here. I'm here. You know, it's uh, Zoom. Yeah, well, it's nice that you're doing things for people who are, you know, you know, don't have capabilities, but how are these people going to be sheet metal workers or work on a PG&E line if they, you know, are, you know, have specific limitations? I realize there's other jobs that they can do, but I would imagine right now the most important thing would be getting people involved in the trades because there's a lack of electricians, plumbers, sheet metal workers, because it's, because it's highly skilled, it's hard to do. And a lot of people uh, have got out, of the, you know, got out of the trades over the years. But I don't understand how these people who maybe have Down syndrome or other, other uh, disabilities able to do highly skilled work. Some can, I've actually seen it happen, but I find it a little interesting how you're going to be able to do this and i i didn't catch it but how much does this program cost the taxpayer of san jose to be able to put people into jobs i'm curious because you know i didn't come from a lot of money and when i needed a job i went and applied for it and you know they the jobs weren't very good but i got the job right you know i didn't have anyone you know put me on the job and all of a sudden you know automatically a magic wand is waved. I was high, it didn't work that way. And I think there comes a time to where when when do we stop holding people's hands to find a job? Uh, I imagine in some cases it's helpful for job, you know, jobs that are in demand, like the trades. But you know, you have these things like forcing fire departments to hire women. I mean most women don't want to work overnight with a bunch of dudes. You know, most women who could be a firefighter could uh, be a nurse. Or a doctor, so I don't know. I just find it weird how the the city council tries to massage who gets a job and who doesn't. You know, the taxpayer in the end pays pays for everything, like we always. Do. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you, Blair Beekman here. Thank you for this item. Uh, you know, to uh, consider. Uh, Nancy Klein, who's been talking about these sort of programs in recent public meetings, uh, the list that Work to Future offered was really good. And it really described, uh, you know, the efforts you want to get young people into more high paying jobs at this time, basically, and, and what can be the ways to do that. Um, I'm all for that. It sounds like a great idea and, and seems you have, you know, good plans to do that. And so that's really good. Um, from the first words of the previous speaker, you've always had a really good uh, trade way to create uh, jobs for young people through through unions and through youth apprentice apprentice work. And I, I would I would hope that this sort of that sort of item can be included in this work to future list and mentioned as as uh, another possible uh, resource and, and way to work. And um, 
you know, I, I hope I, these sort of words that I'm offering, you know, they, they're not maybe speaking exactly to work to future, but they're offering something relevant and, and meaningful and creative and important, I feel. And I hope in the future, during my public comment time, I'm, 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 I'm I can be allowed more space to simply speak about my creative ideas. And, and they're not so creative, but they do try to help a process. They try to be informational. I try to be polite about it. Um, I, I, I think you're relying too much on a certain efficiency for the, the, the uh, public comment process that is excluding creativity and, and openness and, and good alternative ideas and options. So I hope that's something we can consider in the future. And, and, and for the work to a future item, uh, ideas of trade union apprentice job. Thanks. Thank you. Turning to the committee, does anyone have any comments? Council Member Mayhan. Thank you, Chair. Um, th thanks for the update. Really um, awesome to see the progress, and it's a it's an issue I I certainly care a lot about, and I think you know matters to our whole community. Um, I had a just a couple of questions, just trying to dig a little deeper into it. So. Um, on the um, the placements, and just to clarify, I believe I read in the memo, the longer memo, that um, it was it was two thousand one hundred fifty eight individuals placed in employment, secure, who secured employment over the last fiscal year. And do we know how many? I noticed some of those were placement in San Jose Works or placement in uh, coronavirus relief funded programs. Do we have a way of characterizing how uh, sustainable those are and if they, you know, the length of potential employment there? So one of our measures is retention. Yeah. Um, so we do have to make sure, and that's why these individuals work with us for a year after they exit. So at that exit point, when they found employment or education just kind of depends on what they're doing. We, we follow up with them every quarter, if not more, to make sure that they're continuing their work. And that's where we step in again to provide them any type of service they might need, whether it's transportation assistance, clothing, another job, um, more training. So we do work with them to make sure that, that in that fourth quarter, we're getting counted to make sure that they're earning at least a dollar more, um, because that's how we meet our measures from the federal level. That's so great. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. So we're constantly following up with them. And they make we make sure that they also have... Um, or have take advantage of our newsletter so that they know what's happening in real time with us. If there's workshops they, they might need, or if there's a job fair going on, things of that nature as well. And, and I may have missed, thank you. It's great to know that you're following up for a year <laughs> afterwards and, and tracking them forward and providing that additional supportive service. I think that makes a ton of sense. I may have missed it because the memo was, um, was, had a, was chock full of good information. How, um, how much, how, how are the retention figures or, or how, how bad is the attrition, I guess, is another way of framing that. We do, well, some people move. Question. Some people move, some people don't get back to us because it's a lot of um, interface with those individuals. We can track if an individual we can see their income actually. Um, and there are some cases where they're showing zero, but that's when we try to call them again to make sure um, our retention is at a certain level for fourth quarter. It's in the it's in the document that we provided you. So we have to have at least um, for each of them, it's different adults dislocated and youth for the, uh, it's 60, 65%. We met it at 69% for our adults. For dislocated workers, it's 68.1, 67 rather, we made it at 68. And then our youth is 71, we met it at 72.7. That's and right. council member, if I might, I mean, I went, Monique is being uh, modest here, but really for like the last, I believe it's last 20 years, Monique, um, we have met or exceeded all our performance measures and not just retention. Did someone get a job? Did they get a wage gain? Did they get a credential? Are they in that job a year afterwards? And those measures are set by the state of California um, and um, identity require a lot of work and follow up by the team. That's great. And Jeff, is that outlined with those benchmarks in the memo? In, term, in terms of what the benchmarks are, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the state benchmarks that we are meeting or exceeding. I, I didn't notice that, but was that outlined? 
That's yeah. that's those are what we call the required values that are in the, the appendix A to, I see. to the memo. Okay. And, and we're happy to follow up with you. To, it, it gets really complicated, but we're very happy to, to follow up with you and your team to yep. to explain it in more detail if need be. Okay. Anytime you need, we could do a WIOA 101. Cool. Yeah, I'll save some of my more detailed questions for offline. We don't want to take everybody's time. I, I did wonder just at a at kind of back at the conceptual level, I I understand we want to focus on high wage, high growth opportunities, industries that are very promising. I would hope, though, that that would not necessarily dissuade us from playing a matchmaker between small bit local small businesses and people looking for work. And I know we had the the Facebook program, which makes a ton of sense. But just curious, I'll give just a very quick personal anecdote. I happen to be speaking with a small business owner in District 10 this past weekend who runs a painting company, employs two individuals in the community full time, is offering $45 an hour, wants to grow his crew, at least double it, and just isn't able to find people. He's just struggling. He doesn't, he's running a small business to share Foley's point. You know, he's, he's, busier out there just running his company, doesn't necessarily know how to do recruiting, isn't sure where to put the, the job openings. I just wonder to what extent we think, you know, whether it's work to future, a different entity could be playing a matchmaking role or a clearinghouse. Because I, I keep hearing from local business owners that they're paying 20, 30, even $40 an hour and are struggling to find people. Is that your Experience. Yes, yes. So okay. they work, small businesses usually call us and let us know they have a couple positions. Can you post it? Because we do send out a newsletter, email blasts, postings, um, especially if there's a living wage attached to it. We definitely want to get that out to our, our participants. So yes, we, okay. we do work with a lot of small businesses to let them know um, to work with us if they have one, two, three, four positions. So yes. Great. So we can direct our local mm -hmm. small businesses to you for help and matchmaking. That's awesome. Okay, great. And then I guess final question, just back to metrics, because I'm always I'm always into metrics and dashboards. Do you do you look at cost per placement and look at kind of program efficiency? And and then the other interesting piece would be if it costs X dollars per placement over the course of a year or two, whatever time frame, is this the kind of thing where, where you could if we put more money into it, you would see a linear relationship between more dollars in and more job placements, or or is it how scalable? is the model. Uh, I don't know if Jeff wants to talk on that because yeah, you yeah. look at ROI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I guess two responses. One, you know, to share with you back in 2009, um, when the Great Recession happened, we went from about serving 2,000 clients and about four months later, we're serving 10,000 clients. Mm -hmm. um, and we still met all our performance measures and had a very high quality of service that we were offering to those clients. As Monique mentioned, um, we historically have done a rate of a return on investment calculation where we worked with San, Jose, with San Jose State to kind of develop the methodology where we would look at the income that the people that were exiting from our program are earning and how much money we had spent and then take into account other things that they were no longer on, say, the TANF program, so the savings resulting from that. Um, we typically had a rate of return that, Monique, I'm sorry, my memory is what it used to be, it was like maybe three or four times, uh, four, four for every dollar we spent, we were three to four dollars in terms of income, okay. right? Mm -hmm. I think we've run into problems with the state because we rely on the state and for that. And, and during COVID, they haven't been providing that data. But, but as soon as they do, our board values that very much. And I know we look at it in terms of where we should be allocating our dollars. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's exciting to hear that there's that kind of multiplier effect. That's obviously exactly what we'd hope for. And I just appreciate the the update, all the incredible work you all are doing, and, and hope we get a chance to spend some more time together offline. So thank you. Definitely. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I appreciate your questions. Uh, thank you, Monique, for your presentation, and Jeff, for all the work you're doing at Work to Future. Uh, my sister-in-law actually took some training from there in person a few years ago to get her tech skills up a little bit, and it was very helpful to her. So I, I also appreciate that you're focusing on high growth, high wage, I like that. Uh, but to Council Member Mahan's point, small business owners are really looking for employees and they're hard to find. There's uh, a lot of people looking for work, looking to expand their businesses and they're just not out there. So 
if you could, uh, what would be really helpful to the council offices, I think, if you could send us some information, a blurb that we could include in our newsletters so that we could then push it out to our community and the small business owners might just pick up on it, that they might be able to, to go to you and post their business online because a lot of companies are looking for business for employees and really struggling to find anyone to to fit and they go you know they advertise you know craigslist and you know wherever wherever you go to advertise and sometimes that works and sometimes it's not so but you've got people who've been going through some training which would be really helpful to make that to to council member's point to be a matchmaker so that's uh, I would highly encourage that because then we, we're always looking for content and that's just something else that we could push out. Uh, I see no more council member questions or hands raised. So is there a motion to accept this report? So moved. Is there a second? second? Okay, thank you. Then let's vote. Carrasco? Aye. Corrales? Yes. Mahan? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Foley? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Last item is the housing crisis work plan. Who do we have? <laughs> Thank Jared you. Jared, there you are, Jared. Hi. I'm a housing catalyst uh, with the Office of Economic Development um, with Rachel Vanderveen, uh, Deputy Director of the Housing Department, and Michael Brio. Deputy Director of Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. Uh, we're here today to uh, give you an update on the housing crisis work plan. Um, as a reminder, it was first approved in 2018, um, and it's a set of strategies and policy actions intended to facilitate 25,000 new housing units by 2023 uh, that includes 15,000 market rate units and 10,000 affordable units. We provide these updates uh, biannually to the Community Economic Development Committee and uh, to City Council. And this, this is the first update of 2021. So uh, as a part of our update, we provide a report on our housing production. Uh, so this, this report provides um, data through the end of 2020 uh, and includes the first quarter of 2021. Uh, this is a year by year snapshot. So uh, later we have a chart that, that takes into account uh, units moving from one column to the next. Um, we have the, the three categories of units receiving planning approval, units receiving uh, building permits, which is typically the start of construction and then units receiving occupancy. Um, so we closed out 2020, uh, it was one of the best years for affordable housing. Uh, production. As you can see, uh, we talked last time about the impact of the state streamlining on that, as well as some other factors. Um, obviously, as you can see from the report, market rate um, has, you know, trended in below uh, what we had seen in previous years. Uh, rents in multifamily in San Jose fell pretty sharply at the start of the pandemic and vacancy increased. This was especially the case in uh, newer apartments. Uh, and we look closely at the, the data for class A apartments as this is an important data point for um, new market rate units as a, you know, a key, a key to understanding whether or not a project will pencil. Um, Rent started to flatten out at the end of, of 2020 and have started uh, to reverse the trend slightly um, in the first quarter of 2021, as, as well as as vacancy. So, you know, that's something we're going to be keeping a close eye on and we'll keep you updated on. Um, and the next chart just pulls the data from the, the previous chart, just shows you um, market rate units receiving building permits. So this typically indicates the start of construction. Um, you can see, you know, 717 uh, units permitted uh, for market rate. Uh, a majority of those were uh, accessory dwelling units, about 376. Um, so, you know, this is obviously a significant drop, you know, the effects of the pandemic as you know as well as indications that construction costs remain high 
um, as was the case prior to the, the pandemic. Um, and then our last chart. Uh, so this is an overall accounting uh, measuring our progress towards 25,000 housing units. So this looks at the three years so far, plus the first quarter of 2021, looking at the affordable market rate and then the, the combined totals, um, and you can, as you can see here. All right, I'll go ahead and pick up the next slide. My name is Rachel Vanderveen and I'm the Deputy Director of the Housing Department. Um, what I wanted to highlight here was that um, we continue to face challenges to finance affordable housing development in our city and not only just our city, but also across the Bay Area. Um, we have been working together with the mayors of San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland to really kind of put together a united front on this and place pressure on the state. The way that the allocations are, or the points are awarded for allocations for state tax, uh, well, for tax credits and for bond financing, um, really just do not prioritize funding projects in the Bay Area. And so we have um, worked together to send letters up to the state and have really been pushing hard on this. Um, we were glad that there is one, there was one award made to the three Bay Area projects. It happens to be in San Jose. So that was real, that was exciting, um, but it really was actually on an appeal and um, it was really the, at the last minute that we were able to um, secure the award for the Emmanuel Sobrato development. Um, and so anyway, so that we were very happy. However, there are many others that did not secure financing and just continue to sit in a very, what's becoming a very long queue. And so um, we just wanted to continue to raise this issue with all of you and let you know that um, there we're, we still need to figure out how to fix the allocations um, so that we can continue to move forward with the affordable housing that we have already entitled, ready to go. It just needs this last piece of financing. Next slide, please. We've also made some progress on some high priority policy um, work plan items, and then we wanted to highlight those. So in February, the city council refined the 1.5 acre rule that allows 100% affordable projects on sites less than 1.5 acres to move forward outside of the urban village or growth area. And the definition of vacant and underutilized was clarified and um, there was a commercial replacement requirement that was removed from that policy. Additionally, in February, the city council approved changes to the inclusionary housing ordinance, which was a, um, a very large policy update. And um, along with that, the council approved park credits for moderate income house housing units that satisfy the inclusionary housing obligation. Those two really kind of came together in trying to move forward um, uh, market rate developers who are interested in building moderate income housing on site as one way to um, meet their obligation under the inclusionary housing ordinance. Next slide, please. As we look forward to continued work on policy issues supporting our housing initiatives here in the city, we see that we still have more to do. So um, some of our upcoming priorities include um, taking another look at the commercial linkage fee and the implementation of that fee. <coughs> Excuse me, the city council approved the fee but now as we're looking at the implementation we are recognizing that there are different pieces that we need to continue working on and we may need to update some of the policy in order to um, really have an effective implementation. So some of those in, um, areas include the timing of payment, 
there's certain large projects may have two options for payment. We need to clarify the points in the process at which the payment would be required to align with the city, with the milestones that were set forth. We're also looking at the recordation of the payment obligation. We wanna ensure that the responsibility is clear um, so that the developer and staff know what to expect and um, what the timing of that will, the payment will be. We're also looking at credits for various priorities. The city council directed payment of the commercial linkage fee to include um, like offsets, if you will, for developers who are creating affordable housing, on-site historic preservation, or utilizing sustainability standards in the development. And so we are considering how that could work and we may need to actually return with updates to the commercial linkage fee ordinance and resolution in the fall. Finally, we're also working on the affordable housing siting policy. This is going to be a policy that guides decisions related to the location of new affordable housing developments funded by the city. We are intending to help the city continue to affirmatively further fair housing consistent with federal and California fair housing laws. And this is expecting to this policy is expected to be heard by the city council in June. Next slide, please. So some of the one of the, some of the other work uh, ongoing work plan highlights include North San Jose. I think um, as we talked about in our last uh, housing crisis update, um, we are still undergoing a process to retire the North San Jose plan, which would free up a. a you know, the remaining 24,000 or most of the remaining 24,000 units of capacity uh, in the general plan. And we have uh, hired consultants both for CEQA as well as um, a traffic consultant to do the necessary work to, to shut it down. Um, we do need to bring forward a general plan amendments and zoning ordinance amendments as part of, of this process. We'll be bringing those to council and we plan to uh, bring this item, including GPAs and zoning to council in the end of the summer. So the other sort of ongoing work plan item is the San Jose Housing Site Explorer. And this is really a tool, it's a spatial database or a map that um, allows developers or anyone who's interested to be able to find sites to build housing. We've continued to uh, promote this this great tool, um, uh, we participated in an event, Affordable Yay. Housing Month actually, um, that SV at Home sponsored on May 17th and we, uh, we, we, we unveiled this or, or, or showed this tool to housing developers, affordable housing developers in particular to um, make them aware of it and how they can show them how to use it for future uh, uh, finding of sites. Um, next slide, please. So the other, the other uh, big item uh, that wasn't previously included in our, work pro, pro, in our work plan, but now is, of course, this is the granddaddy of them all, is the housing element update. This is the sixth RENA cycle from 2022 to 2030. So I think, as you all recall, every eight years, we are required by the state to update our housing element, and we are working on that now. Um, and we have to, uh, you know, we have to complete this process and get a, the housing element to the state by January 1st, 2023 for certification. Um, this housing element, we've been allocated uh, by HCD 62, just over 62,000 housing units, which is a number that's actually relatively light compared to most of the other cities in the Bay Area, at least as a percentage increase. Um, and we are gonna, this, this, at the end, in June, really, we're gonna be starting our public outreach, uh, initiating our public outreach for this process. We'll be launching our website. Um, and uh, so it's a, a significant body of work that we're undertaking. So related to that is an assessment of fair housing. We have to document how we are furthering, uh, furthering the uh, achievement of fair housing in San Jose. So this is a part of the housing element. Um, we'll be working with VTA, other city departments, the Santa Clara Office of Education to draft um, strategies on how we can address um, inequities of the past and make more inclusive communities within San Jose. Um, and we'll be conducting outreach in, on this 
in the summer of, of 2020. We'll, bring, we'll be bringing our findings and our strategies to uh, this CED committee as well as the, the, the NSC committee. Um, and all of this work will be uh, integrated, of course, in our housing element that goes to the state for certification. Next slide. And that concludes our presentation on the housing crisis work program or update, and we are available for questions. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. I appreciate the report. Uh, before we go to the committee, I'll turn to the members of the public. Caller user number one. Yeah, code enforcement. Yeah, you guys are uh, real popular out there these days, the way you guys manipulate everything, including the housing. It sounds like what you're going to do there. I wonder who's going to have priority for this low-income housing. wouldn't be surprised there's friends the, on the city council and yourselves who work there. I mean, well, I mean, look who you guys hire. Remember William Gary, Jerry, Fair, whatever his name is, got busted for extortion and uh, sexual assault that's the kind of people you guys hire so I wonder how many more people like William Jerry are on your payroll and what kind of people are they how they can manipulate things and they're in contact with law enforcement who else are they in contact with uh, you know are these the kind of people that uh, should be managing our housing I mean they're usually the kind of people who are looking over your over your fence pe as peeping toms into your window seeing if you have a shed in your backyard or a flagpole that's too high. Uh, I just want to know, what kind of people are working for you that drive around in these Priuses scowling at everybody, uh, making sure that they're staying in line, like uh, you're some HOA people uh, enforcing these, these draconian rules? Uh, I'd like to know. I'd like to know who's in line for all this housing and if they're related if they're godchildren or related to people in the city council, code enforcement, San Jose PD, I'd like to know what the transparency is of who gets this housing and why, who who gets their application on the top of the of the pile. If you guys could explain that to me, and you know that would be interesting, or maybe you know put it on on the internet versus having to search for it like Pam wants you to. You know, she'll put it, she'll bury it somewhere in the internet to be impossible to get to. If you guys were transparent, you would put all these things that I mentioned on your Facebook pages and on your, on the city council page and on the city of San Jose page, but you don't want to do that Thank because. You. Mr. Beekman. Talking about the housing crisis work plan. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you for your patience for my words on the, uh, Final words on the, on the last item. Uh, I'm a bit simple, I'm a bit uneducated, but I, I give it a lot of heart and I think I'm offering something pretty darn good and decent. And we can talk about uh, in the coming few months how I can better work the public comment process and we can have a better understanding about the thing. And uh, thanks for your time and patience with that and we can work it out. Uh, I'm, I'm confident of that. Um, for this item, uh, trying to learn to speak about housing issues uh, you know, the, the housing department of San Jose, you know, seems really dedicated to affordable housing ideas at this time. And it's really nice to hear. If you look at the statistics, uh, there was what, 2,500 market rate homes uh, built, I guess. That was the final statistic. And 500 affordable rate homes built in 2020. That uh, translates in my thinking that, you know, 250 of those 500 affordable housing are going to be at about market rate. And that leaves 250 homes or less, probably less of a real VLI, ELI and mixed income affordable housing solutions. We really got to think of solutions. Uh, you know, how do we house people who have trouble being housed? And uh, so good luck in how you do that. Um, it was reported uh, between a conversation in uh, NSC last week between Reagan and uh, Henninger and uh, Maya Sparza about uh, mixed income ideas aren't going to really come online until about the late 2020. Um, I hope we can prep ourselves now for that good work uh, and that's possible uh, with that with those things and you know my feelings about mixed income for the uh, zoning issues single family zoning issues I really hope that can help and always think of mixed income and how we can develop that at this time, we can really begin really good practices now 
which is a part of the efforts I'm totally building, trying to help build, you know, for all many projects at this time. Thanks. Thank you. Turning to the committee, do any members of the committee have any comments? Council Member Mahan. Thanks, Chair. Just, just a few questions. Um, I, I noticed a few weeks ago on May 7th, the California Department of Finance issued a report that looked at demographic trends and housing production together. I can dig it up and share it with folks, but it um, noted interestingly that California lost about one half of 1% of our population over the past year, which was the first time since the state has recorded population estimates that we've lost population over a 12 month period like that. Usually it bounces back and kind of averages out to slight increases. Um, but, but what I found most interesting was um, in the first appendix, they had tables of housing production, unit production across the state. And the first table showed new unit growth in 2020 and we were not on the top 10 list. So we, it was, it was interesting, we, we had, so obviously, you know, Los Angeles, we would not expect to be beating, but um, it looked like San Francisco had over four times the unit production we had, same for San Diego, Oakland was about three times the unit production, Santa Clara just next door was over two times, Irving was over two times, Sacramento, Santa Ana, Bakersfield, Fresno, all, all uh, significantly about 50% ahead of us. And so obviously it's looking at one year, but I guess I raised the question, um, you know, a lot of different challenges, COVID's impacted everyone, but this seems like a pretty diverse range of cities that seem to be producing housing at a faster clip. I know historically San Jose has been a great actor on housing production, and you could argue we've produced too many houses relative to jobs and all of that. But I'm just curious, is there, do we think there's something unique to San Jose or something we should be doing differently or why, why it is that we're not on the top 10, I don't even know if we're on the top 15 list for housing, just unit production over the last year or how we should interpret that data? I think, well, I think a number of us could respond to that. I'll, I'll take the first crack at it. I think one of the things that is unique to San Jose is our, is our rents, right? So what we've found is that, the, and this is really pre-pandemic, but I think it it's obviously holds true now and probably in the years coming as we recover from the, the pandemic, is that you know construction costs are very, very high in the Bay Area, but they're pretty much the same anywhere in the Bay Area. And as crazy as our high as our rents are, what we found is the rents are not high enough to, co to compensate for the, the really high cost of construction. The cost of construction was going up at, at 1% a month, uh, prior to the pandemic. I'm not sure what it is now, frankly. I know that lumber costs, for example, are going really, really high. So that's one of the challenges that we, fought, we have found is it's just that it, the projects are not penciling out. And the kind of, the focus on the housing projects that we've had in this general plan in the city now, you know, it used to be the single family house, which you could set up an assembly line, not much unlike building Model T Fords, except, <clears throat> um, and we're not doing that anymore. And then, you know, we were moving to court home projects and we, we don't have a lot of land for that either. So we're really focusing on higher density, um, medium to high density projects, the sort of five over one, four over one, six, seven over one projects, as well as high rises in downtown. And those are very, very complicated and expensive projects to put together. They need big capital out of Wall Street and pension funds. And um, and the rents are, are haven't been there in most of the city, not all of the city, like West San Jose, we've seen that there are rents that are high enough where projects will move forward, but not high enough to get capital to invest in those projects to move to construction. So I think that is one of the, the, the real challenges that we have. I know we have the cost of development, Jared can talk about that in a minute, but um, where we're gonna be digging into this issue uh, further and, and bringing the results of that consultant work back to council. I believe it's this fall, Jared can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I think that really is, is one of the, the, um, the, the main things and where we're seeing success, it's the small and mighty ADUs. And that's where in a sense, you've kind of democratized construction once again, how con construction was done historically in this town in, in the United States where you have you know, small property owners, homeowners that are, that are building housing. And so I think, um, yeah, so a lot of it really, I think has to do with the cost of construction and the challenges of finding sites. You know, a lot of our urban villages, for example, 
um, are small properties and you have to assemble them. They're owned by families that have owned the properties for years. They have, they're under Prop 13 in terms of taxes. They're not always an incentive to sell. I think opening up North San Jose is going to help a lot because you have big properties up there. And that's been an area uh, with 24,000 housing units of capacity that's been offline because um, we couldn't move forward from phase one to phase two of the North San Jose's um, how, you know, phasing for housing and, and jobs up there. So that I think was going to help tremendously. I'll turn it over to anybody else on the team who wants to. Yeah, just add, I think Michael captured it pretty well. I mean, the, the you know, the market factors are, 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 you know, a major, play a major role in that. And we, we do intend to update our cost of residential development study. We've had two so far. The last was in November of 2019. We plan to do, plan to bring one forward to council at the end of, end of this year to really understand, you know, uh, what's going on and how, you know, what, what changes could we, you know, be making and, and how things are, are working in our, in our market. Um, and I, I would just add to, you know, looking historically at, at data as well. I mean, right around the 24 to 2,500 building permits a year is, is really what we've averaged. I think even going back to, if you went back to the 90s and late 80s, I think one of the, if you go back to kind of the 2000s, our biggest year was coming right out of the last recession where you had kind of a, a buildup of kind of entitlements and then there was about 4,000 in one year, but every other year is kind of trended around that 2,500 uh, unit total. But, you know, if, if um, still be interested to look more at that data closely and, and, and understand it. So, you know, obviously we want to make improvements. Our intention is not to, to hold back, you know, we, we <laughs> so. yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. I'd be happy to share that. I'll, I'll grab the PDF here and share it with you offline. And so, so why are rents higher in Oakland or even Fremont? I noticed that just breaking out the multifamily, we were basically tied with Fremont, which is a fraction the size of San Jose. Are you telling me that, Fremont's building as many units as we are in, multi, in the multifamily area because rents are higher? Yeah, I, I can't speak to Fremont. I think what we usually compare ourselves is the Santa Clara, Sunnyvale, Mountain View, Palo Alto, Los Alto, all the other cities that surround us. And those, those communities have a lot more jobs. They're closer to employment. Now, again, we're in a pandemic world, so things are a little strange, right? But in the normal world, that's where the, a lot of the jobs are and people are commuting to. And so because they have more proximity, it's the old economic model of the central business district, the closer to the central business district you were, the higher the residential rents would be as well. And I think that's really why, and it's why in West San Jose, where we've seen the rents are high enough to uh, compensate for the increased cost of construction that projects have moved to construction. That's because you're close to the Apple mothership, you're closer to other jobs, it's closer commute to Palo Alto. So that's generally what we're, we're finding. And in the research that Jared referenced, that sounded like cost of construction, but not an analysis of rents and the differential. Is that data that we, do we have updated data on that? It, it's more than just that. It's, it's, it's overall, it looks at, at prototypical development across the city and for so cost of multifamily. I, I'll share the latest study with you so you kind of get an understanding of, of, of what we're looking at. And I mean, just to kind of share that the results from that, you know, looking at multifamily across the shit city, um, you know, really showed that it, uh, market rate multifamily was only really feasible in West San Jose and, and in North San Jose based on the, the rent achievable and cost of construction and all the other factors as well so that 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 you know created a real challenge right makes sense and obviously I, I know we're all very hopeful and excited that as as bart comes to san jose and comes through through downtown in particular that we'll see more jobs more um you know we'll see that um not that we want upward pressure on rents but we'll see that investment calculus change a little bit in some areas some additional areas of the city so that but but i also you know obviously we don't we don't want to wait. Um, I guess I'm curious. Sorry, curious as well. Um, this will be my last question. But I just I noticed in today's presentation that that we were highlighting commercial linkage fee and the affordable housing siting policy, both of which sound important. But I, I didn't see any emphasis on attracting investment in market rate housing, which historically has accounted for the largest share of new units, and obviously is 
important for generating the inclusionary fees that we can apply to fund more affordable housing. So I'm, I'm just curious, do we think that whatever levers we could pull to try to incentivize more market rate housing investment in San Jose and our urban villages, for example, that that, that isn't um, higher leveraged or more impactful than, than what we're currently emphasizing? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the questions that the cost of development study analyzes. And so I think we'll have more updated information for you um, this fall when that work is presented. But, you know, I think Jared, correct me if I'm wrong, but what we found is that while, you know, city costs in general are a significant portion of, you know, the overall cost of development, um, it wasn't a, a lever that, um, that we could pull sufficiently enough in most cases to move projects from uh, financial infeasibility to feasibility and construction. But that's the kind of question that the consultant will be digging into and updating just to see, you know, to what degree does the city, does it have levers that it can pull? Yeah, and just to, just to be clear, just quickly add, and then Jared, if you want to chime in, I, I'm not necessarily advocating for reducing fees or, or um, I, I generally think it's a, it's a losing battle when cities are, are cutting fees and subsidizing to attract uh, investment. I think that's a, that's a real risk unless those fees are somehow out of market and, and inappropriate given the surrounding marketplace. I guess I'm more thinking about process improvements, moving to a universal fee, figuring out how to, how to you know, speed up processes, create more certainty, um, you know, streamlining or improving from the city's perspective, how we do environmental review, speeding up the, the turnaround time on inspections and other, other decision points in the process. I mean, it feels to me like a real emphasis on that could generate more investment that could kind of snowball and generate significantly more inclusionary fees for funding affordable housing. But it, it doesn't sound like we think that is the a, a, a primary strategy at this point, which is fine if we don't think it's promising. I'd just be curious to know what the thought process is. Well, I don't think it do think it is. Um, and actually, I just want to note that council took action on two, last Tuesday night to streamline both market rate and affordable housing development. So I think a big, where we're trying to go is, hey, you know, in the, back in the day, and really even up till recently, you need to do a plan development zoning to implement these high density mixed use projects. In some cases, with conditional use permit. Now, what the council has said is, no, if you're going to build what the general plan wants, um, it's it's permitted by right, and it goes to director's hearing on Wednesday. So, our 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 goal here and our purpose is really to tr is to continue to try to to streamline development that the general plan wants. So there's less process, less more certainty for developers, and more clarity. Yeah, I, I think I, I would just add. I think you know what what we sort of highlighted in our presentation, maybe even in some of the memo, are, are kind of just just pieces of kind of the overall, uh, you know, I think attracting investment is a huge part of, you know, what, what my role is intended to do in terms of having conversations in the investment community and talking with developers, you know, something we, we definitely want to do and process improvement is huge. You know, the development fee framework, kind of that universal fee idea is a council priority that, that you know, we're working on um, separately and, you know, is something that we, we do want to pursue as well. So, you know, I think a lot of those things are, are kind of ongoing in the background. I think we were just trying to highlight kind of policy actions and decisions that would be done and associated with work plan, but all of that is encapsulated in this work. And, you know, we do think it is a very high priority. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And thanks for the example, Mark. I was very happy to, to vote for that last Tuesday. So I, yes, I, I appreciate that step forward for sure. Yeah. Thank okay. you. We were excited too. Yeah, no, it made a ton of sense. Glad we're doing that. Okay, great. I've taken enough of everyone's time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, of course, CEQA would fall, reform would really help speed up the process too, but that's not something really within our power. Council Member Perales. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree with that last statement. Certainly there's some things, actually most of the things I would say that are out of our power, uh, specifically the number one, which is just really that the economics of the, the cost of building housing and then, then the, the actual rate that, that are uh, being achieved, whether it's for sale or, or uh, rent, which is staggering to hear, as staff pointed out, considering where uh, rates are at, um, to, to understand that that still factors in. Um, and we've had certainly had a number of conversations along the lines of processes. And I would say I get, because um, I actually would agree with Councilor Mayhan, you know, there are 
always ways where we can improve and try to, to, to streamline and remove some of the, the red tape or hurdles. Um, I, I get some mixed messages as well, I would say, from the development community. There are, are some that say that, um, you know, it's a terribly daunting uh, and lengthy process. And uh, I get others, um, namely those that have developed outside of the state in, in, in a number of other areas, uh, other urban environments, that say that they really appreciate the uh, process here and the staff um, in San Jose. And so I think it really is perspective, right? It's, it's on where you've developed before and, um, and where you have experienced, um, you know, uh, that process in other cities and, and then comparatively. Um, so I think, you know, that, again, that's sort of perspective. And I, and I would say uh, I get those mixed messages, which, you know, uh, it still shows that we have some work to do because uh, it'd be nice to, to hear that all around the board uh, or across the board, but, um, Nonetheless, I think uh, certainly continued uh, work that we have to do. For me, really, the specific question is in regards to the affordable uh, and the goal that we have on the 10,000 affordable units by 2023. We're certainly not um, right uh, on on task to to hit that mark um, as far as the entitled under construction or completed is concerned. Uh, the market rate we're nearly at the the 15,000, um, and I know we have. Uh, you know, obviously all kinds of goals in regards to how can we get that re those resources. We're certainly going to be seeing an influx now um, on resources from the state, which is exciting. Uh, what is the plan to, I think, be able to take advantage of this opportunity that we have in front of us uh, and not just, you know, personally to hit that goal, um, the 10,000, because we know we, we, we could continue to push for even more as we would need more. Uh, but at least as we have the goal, uh, what is the plan over the next couple of years to try and achieve that? We're, you know, we've got uh, less than two years essentially left um, for that 2023 goal. So uh, curious how we're going to get there. It's a, it's a big gap that we've got to close there. Yeah, thank you, Council Member, for the question. Um, there are, you know, there's a lot of different keys to meeting that goal. There's a lot of different steps in development. Um, and you know, there's policy priorities we can bring forward and funding priorities. And um, at this point, what we are doing is um, we have Measure E has passed, which was actually a really big, um, a very helpful tool in our toolbox. Um, it provides additional funding. So we are looking to bring forward our affordable housing siting policy, which will help us figure out where, where is it gonna go. And then um, we plan to release our notice of funding availability. Um, we did that, um, it's been a couple of years ago already now, but we released $100 million and that actually um, resulted in 11 new projects that we're able to move forward and, and we're still working through those. And, um, and so we want to do the same thing where we release um, a NOFA, we have developers out there securing sites and then working through the process. Now, the next, the other thing that I did bring up today, which we're at, we are very concerned about is just accessing our state bond allocations and tax credits. And so we're gonna continue to make that a priority for our, um, for basically our intergovernmental relations um, priorities because the way that the formulas are set up now, the, re the reason that we're not there's a couple of reasons, but one of the primary reasons is the cost of development. It comes back to cost development again, because what the state is doing is using the cost of, of development per on a per unit basis to act as a tiebreaker. And so it's a very numeric number. They just calculate how much it is and they put the, the projects in order based on your cost of development. And what's happening is projects in other areas are really coming in ahead of us. And so that is a real concern. Um, we're also looking at trying to change the allocation of funding just for the Bay Area because we are, again, LA is just coming in really strong and LA is um, receiving a much greater portion of the allocations in that area down South versus the Bay Area. So. We're keeping that in the conversation because again, even if we have all the funds, I mean, we, we really ha must have um, 
tax credits and, and bond allocations from the state in order to move forward. So um, we have to keep pushing on that because we could end up just with a whole lineup of, of projects that are ready, but just can't move forward. And so we're concerned about that as well, because as soon as they get their allocation, they are building permits, they pull their building permits and they start construction. So it's really that, that last step. Um, and so we want to really continue pushing on that. And, and just to uh, circle back on the cost of development too, on the last update, we also looked at cost of affordable development and we would like to update that as well as part of this next update. So we have a, a, a you know, understanding of that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. And, and, I, and I recognize uh, that it is a unique challenge that we have here in the Bay Area, which I think is why it's, it, it is so important that we do work and think regionally on this issue. As you point out, Rachel, that um, you know the challenge we have versus Southern California and LA, it, it, that it's not unique for just San Jose, it's really Northern California and, and specifically the Bay Area region that is not able to capitalize on uh, these uh, tax increment financing and being able to get th that, that uh, that last hurdle uh, covered, and as you point out, and I, I've had a number of these projects as well that are sitting around uh, waiting, right, a couple cycles, and so they're just, yeah. you know, waiting there, and, and that's to nobody's benefit, um, and if this is something that, you know, uh, a developer saying this is all we need left to be able to, to actually construct this project, um, then I do think, right, it's to our benefit to utilize uh, and lean on our, uh, our regional legislative uh, representatives here in the Bay Area, so then that way they can help us solve this problem together. And I know you're talk, uh, you mentioned about using the IGR team. Is there a more concerted regional effort with our IGR team and maybe other um, you know, uh, government relations teams in the Bay Area to do this? I know through ABAG and MTC there's conversations, but is there something that you are aware of that our IGR team is, is, is doing? Well, the... Um... Well, we, there's been a real strong conversation between the three mayors within the Bay Area. So um, they, we have a team that's been meeting regularly to um, push different places. So they've worked together to write a letter um, to SIDLAC, the, the allocating agency. They've also written to the legislature. They're starting to have conversations. So there's been a lot of unity with those three, um, which I think has been fairly effective. We've definitely gotten, um, I mean, you know, just in my opinion, I think the one, um, the one appeal that did get approved, I felt like part of that was, it was almost an acknowledgement of, of the challenge and the results of the fact that the Bay Area received no allocations up until that one. So anyway, I, I mean, that's just a tiny example, but at the same time, I think that um, they're understanding they need to do something. They're not, you know, and it's it may not be clear exactly what the path is right now, but there is a recognition that this isn't going to work. You can't simply not build affordable housing in the Bay Area. That is just not a solution. So um, so that having the three mayors work together, is, I have seen it be effective, um, but I think we need to just continue to figure out how to have a voice and, and participate in the conversation. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, certainly hopeful that we can overcome this challenge as well, because I think this is this is unfortunate to see so many projects that, that are you know, almost, uh, essentially ready to go uh, and then and then sitting there. Okay, uh, thanks for the update. All, uh, if we don't have a motion, I'll make a motion to approve the report. Sorry. Great. Okay, great, thank you. I just have a couple comments before we vote. Uh, the, the lack of getting approved for any funding is really disconcerting. I'm glad to see one project got through, but when our arena goals are so high, that's not helping us at all. So uh, also I, I worry uh, in, in District 9, I have several affordable housing projects coming along and it could be as many, I haven't, I haven't counted them lately, but almost a thousand units in affordable housing. So I wonder how many of those are depending on the state bond funds or the tax credits. 
and probably most of them because they cobble developers cobble funds together so i'm i'm concerned about those projects and how they're going to be playing out and and i don't want to see any of them stalled because we definitely need more housing but uh, we need someone at, we need we need the state's help on that so i'm glad the governor the three mayors are together if you need our help i'm sure the council will uh assist writing letters if that's helpful whatever whatever we can do to assist to help get shovels in the ground and construction started is really where we need to go it's nice to have the approval or or developers who want who have tied up project a tied up project to develop but if they can't build then it hasn't advanced any of our our initiatives um with that let's vote Carrasco? Aye. Morales? Yes. Mahan? Aye. Esparza? Yes. And Foley? Aye. Thank you. Great. That concludes our meeting. We have time for open forum. Do we have any members of the public wishing to speak? Mr. Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, quick reminder, uh, there were 3,000 homes built in 2020. Uh, 2,800 of those homes were at or about uh, market rate. So, you know, we have to have a perspective that, you know, we were already trying to learn how to build affordable housing ideas before COVID-19. I hope we can continue those good practices. The housing department sure is trying to. And uh, we need a bit of a different perspective in, in your big words of market rate housing and its economy uh, at this time, I feel. Um, to also offer, you know, my last item I offered, uh, I kind of blubbed, blubbered my, my final words. I, you know, in the next five years, we really have to uh, consider our best practices, our best selves. And we're in kind of a rebuilding time it's, it's if our best practices now in five years time, we, we can see a really good future that's uh, we've set a course for. And that doesn't come from the mayor making these kind of sleazy and cynical natural gas deals on the side. This comes in, in directly addressing issues and not, and not, not making these cheap deals. Um, thank you incredibly for uh, wanting to reconsider reimagine ideas and that you're willing to work with community. You guys did amazing. Um, to really consider, it was mentioned at budget time, uh, a reimagined task force, what that can be at this time, what that can answer to and ask about for the next few years and prepare us for. We can do work now and, and, and create answers now for, for issues and, and for our future and work towards a long-term future that is simply addressing the ideas of peace and the end of war. These are concepts we've been working on for a while now, and uh, it is our sustainability. Uh, it is our future. So good luck in how you do that. And to mention, uh, uh, talk to the vendors uh, vendors union at the flea market if you want uh, to use the snail mail route and talk to Fred Buzo of Spur. He's got some good answers about how to address the flea market at this time. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Caller user number one, Michael. Yeah, it's sad to see these places go, the flea market, the drive-ins, all these institutions that are going to give way to some sort of low-income housing and transit villages. I love the term village. I wonder if there's going to be enough water for these villages. But, uh, yeah, you know, you're going to see these things go away. And anytime you have these transit hubs, they're never cracked up to what they're going to be. The people at the flea market, I hate to say it, you know, there's going to be bike lanes and a, probably a statue of Sam on a bicycle. Uh, you know, don't, your 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 vending area will be gone. It'll be a Taco Bell and a Jamba Juice and a CVS, which there's already a CVS there, which is that's never ever a neighborhood improvement. I think CVS is one of the worst companies in the world. If I had it my way, I'd get rid of the one in my neighborhood in District Nine. It's terrible, worst store I've ever been in in my whole life. Uh, but yeah, that's what you're going to get over there. You know, that's what you're going to get for gentrification. Uh, to have Bart over there, and the people who are angry with it, you should 
your your mayor and your city council sold you out, man. They punked you out like there's no tomorrow, and and then now you're standing there with what? Nothing. It's too bad. Uh, they they promised that everything was going to be okay, and then once the thing gets built, oh oh sorry, your vending area is gone. You know, but what this is what they do. They don't do anything for the people. We got burned out buildings in District Nine. Pam hates hearing this, but I love telling her again and again. Fix the burned out buildings before you try to build a village. And where's all this electricity going to come for? Come from when you get rid of natural gas? What about the water? We're going to be in a water shortage. You know how much water it takes to do all this construction? This is going to be the new gold. And they're not going to be able to have enough water if they're going to ration it like uh, Uncle Gavin up there in, the, in Sacramento is going to tell you to do. It's going to be a disaster. You wait until that part. That concludes part. our meeting. Thank you very much. See you next time.